Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. This meeting of the board of chiropractic examiners is being held by teleconference pursuant to the statutory provisions of government code section 11133. The date is Wednesday, October 26th, and the time is 9.07 a.m. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being recorded. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. We will now take roll call. Mr. Sweet, would you please call the roll? Yes. Uh, Dr. Paris? Present. Dr. Adams? Present. Raphael Sweet? Present. Ms. Cruz? Present. Dr. Daniels? Present. Thank you, Mr. Sweet. Um, I will now turn this meeting over to Judge Wong for the petitioner hearings. All right, thank you, Dr. Paris. Um, uh, does the board prefer that I call the matters in order listed on agenda or in a different order? Um, we, we usually do them in order unless, unless you have a preference. Nope, that, that, that is perfectly fine. That's okay. the order I will call them in. Thank you. Okay. Um, so just, um, so the 1st 1 we'll hear is Annie, my Tran. And, um, before we do that, just some, uh, procedural, um, guidance, um, for anyone who may have not, uh, who may not have appeared, um, at a petition hearing before. Uh, so, um, I'll call a case, um, and then establish a quorum for the record. Um, and then next, Mr. Stone, the deputy attorney general, uh, I'll, I'll take his appearance. I'll take the petitioner's appearance. Also petitioner's counsel, uh, if there is counsel, um, and then Mr. Stone will, um, offer the petition. And other uh, supporting documents and provide a short overview overview of the history of the um, uh, prior discipline of the license. Um, after that overview, um, it'll turn over to petitioner to uh, present his or her case um, uh, and um, provide testimony and evidence as to why um, his or her petition should be granted. Um, one thing I'd like to remind all the petitioners of is that we're not here to read litigate the prior discipline. Um, that's already has been, uh, established. And now when Mr. Stone, uh, provides his summary, he'll talk a little bit about the discipline just, just for context and to explain, um, while why we're here. Um, and then during your presentation, you could do the same, but again, what the board is most focused on is any rehabilitation subsequent to that prior discipline. Um, and of course, if you have any questions during, during the hearing or at any time, please do not hesitate to um, ask. So with that having been said, if we could um, go ahead and start with um, Annie Maitran and Mr. Harris, I think I heard you before, but I just want to make sure we can still hear you. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And Ms. Tran. Good morning, Your Honor and doctors of the board. Good morning. All right. So, Madam Court Reporter, if we could go ahead and go on the record. So, we're on the record before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of surrendered license by Annie, A-N-N-I-E, middle name Mai, M-Y, last name Tran, T-R-A-N. It is agency case number AC-2017-1131, and it's OAH number 2022090800. My name's Foran Wong. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I have been assigned to preside over this matter. 
Uh, to establish a quorum of the board for the record, I request that each member respond audibly after his or her name is called. Uh, Dr. Perez. Present. Dr. Adams. Present. Mr. Sweet. Present. Ms. Cruz. Present. And Dr. Daniels. Present. Thank you. And let the record reflect that a quorum of the board is present. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Stone, if I may take your appearance for the record, please. So, thank you. Good morning, Your Honor, board members, the petitioner, counsel. Uh, this is Deputy Attorney General Jeff Stone appearing on behalf of the people of the state of California pursuant to government code section 11522. Good morning, Mr. Stone. And um, next, Mr. Harris, if I may take your appearance. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning and good morning to members of the board and council. Uh, Scott Harris on behalf of the petitioner, Annie Mitran. Thank you and let the reflect, uh, record reflect that Ms. Tran is also present. All right. Um, so, uh, Mr. Harris, did, um, did you have any questions about uh, the proceeding or the procedural aspects or anything else? No, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Stone, if you would like to provide your summary statement or documents, whichever you'd like to do first. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, I believe that you've all received the notice of the hearing and declaration of service, which brings us all here uh, today at uh, this date, time, and place. Um, we have uh, in the records uh, at um, what's been base labeled uh, BCE 1 through 271, petitioner's application for reinstatement of surrendered license and attachments, um, which have been submitted to the board. And then we have uh, Bates labeled uh, BCE 272 through 283, the certified copies of petitioner's prior disciplinary documents on file with the board. By way of background, uh, on or about February 16, 2007, uh, the board issued Doctor of Chiropractic License Number DC 30508 to Annie Mitran. Uh, and the license was surrendered to the board effective May 19, 2018. Um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, surrender was in relation to the decision and order in case number AC 2017-1131. And um, that was uh, based on an accusation uh, filed um, uh, in March 20, on March 23rd, 2017. Uh, relating to uh, three causes of action or causes for discipline, uh, conviction of su substantially related crime, uh, conviction involving dishonesty, and uh, acts of fraud. Generally speaking, the, uh, the, the conviction uh, and the underlying conduct uh, was theft from an elder or dependent adult, and uh, the sentence uh, appears from that conviction of uh, Penal Code uh, 368 uh, Subdivision D uh, was four years in jail, um, uh, two years of which was uh, suspended, uh, two years of mandatory supervision. Uh, the allegations generally related to um, the theft, uh, forgery, and fraud and identity theft of an elder or dependent adult, uh, dishonesty, and fraud. Uh, since that time, from the petition, it looks like that uh, Ms. Tran um, has been employed as a uh, assistant or aide, chiropractic uh, assistant or aide. She has, uh, you'll see in the documentations, uh, been in therapy with the Dr. Ferris. Uh, you can see that at uh, page uh, BCE 39. There are letters of reference that have been submitted uh, uh, from chiropractors at uh, BCE 42 from her uh, probation uh, monitor at uh, BCE 50 and uh, from other uh, other individuals beginning at BCE uh, page uh, 51. There uh, was an order of cost recovery in the underlying action, uh, the costs of investigation enforcement in the amount of six thousand um, dollars ordered prior to the issuance of a new or reinstated license. Um, and uh, believe that that amount is still uh, due and outstanding. There have not been any other previous petitions uh, for reinstatement, and the um, 
petitioner has submitted uh, continuing education documentation, uh, which uh, appears pursuant to CCR Title 16, Section 365, uh, to be sufficient um, to fulfill the continuing education requirements. Uh, more specifically, in that regard, It appears that there's been uh, 96 hours of continuing education completed, including eight hours of ethics and law and 16 hours of the mandatory subject areas. And uh, with that uh, background, um, I would um, submit it uh, to counsel and petitioner and the board for uh, further review before. Great, thank you, Mr. Stone. Uh, let's go ahead and mark um, the uh, documents that have been submitted. So, I'll mark the October 20th, 2022 request to set as exhibit 1. Um, exhibit 2 will consist of the October 12th, 2022 memorandum to the board. Continuing education log and petition for reinstatement of revoked license and supporting documents. And then 3 will consist of petitioners supplemental documents uh, for. Um, consists of the decision and order, stipulated surrender of license and order and accusation. And then five consists of a notice of hearing and memorandum to uh, Mr. Stone. Uh, so first, um, Mr. Harris, any objection to one and or five being admitted for jurisdictional purposes only? No, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, uh, those two exhibits are so admitted. And then, um, Mr. Harris, any objections to two, three, um, and or four being admitted for all purposes? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Those exhibits will be admitted for all purposes. All right, Mr. Harris, um, now is your um, opportunity to present your um, evidence on behalf of Ms. Tran. Um, if I recall correctly, you have a witness that you are going to call in addition to Ms. Tran. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. We have okay. two witnesses, Ms. Tran and uh, Dr. Jeffrey Tucker. Okay. Uh, and we would like Ms. Tran to go first. Um, but if I may make an opening statement, um, I would appreciate the opportunity if that's okay with you. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, members of the board um, and board staff, thank you for being here today. On behalf of Ms. Tran, uh, we're very appreciative of you taking the time to review her petition for reinstatement. As uh, Mr. Stone and Judge Wong have indicated, the purpose of today's hearing is really to evaluate the rehabilitation that has occurred. And we can look to many factors, the length of time which has elapsed since the underlying incidents, now a decade. Um, we can look at uh, the compliance with the criminal sentencing of the court, which was done. Um, and in fact, Ms. Tran was released early from her jail sentence. Um, and in fact, has supplied a letter to you at BCE 50 from her then probation monitor. Uh, highly irregular for a probation officer to support someone like Ms. Tram. We have evidence that she's paid restitution. We have evidence that she has been gainfully employed um, for a long period now in the chiropractic profession, working for Dr. Jeffrey Tucker. We know that she has gone to therapy found codependence anonymous to address some of her issues uh, and desires to take care of others. And we know that she has highly invested in herself through her continuing education and her efforts to invest in the community. There are numerous, and I mean numerous letters of reference which speak to Ms. Tran's character, her trustworthiness, her desires to be in the chiropractic profession, and the remorse and understanding that she has about the conviction that she suffered in 2000. And 17. So we hope at the end of this petition hearing that the board will find that it is in the public's interest to issue a license or reinstate the license of Ms. Tran so that she can practice as a chiropractor once again. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, would you like to call Ms. Tran at this time? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tran, if I could have you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly, solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, Your Honor. 
Thank you very much. You may put your hand down. Um, if I could have you start by stating and spelling your full name for the record, please. My name is Annie Mai Tran, A N N I E M Y T R A N. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Good morning, Annie. How are you today? Good morning. I am nervous and I want to say thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to ask for mercy and forgiveness for my horrific actions. Annie, for some background, can you please tell us how old are you? I am 41. And where did you attend undergraduate university? I attended University of Southern California. And you later then attended chiropractic university as well? Yes. And from At, where did you graduate with a chiropractic degree? I attended chiropractic school at Southern California University of Health Sciences. What made you choose to go into the chiropractic profession? I choose the chiropractic profession because my grandfather was bedridden for almost 10 years. I felt and still feel that chiropractic medicine will promote overall wellness to everyone. Very good. Um, now, we heard from Mr. Stone that you were licensed originally in 2007. Is that correct? Yes. And can you please tell us about your um, career as a chiropractor between 2007 and when you lost your license in 2018? I practiced at a multidisciplinary practice with orthopedic as well as physiatrists, helping patient rehabilitate and be able to function without, with less pain. Did you also at any point have your own practice? I have a small private practice. And do you recall the years in which you had that practice? It was into it was a small practice. Therefore, it was Probably about 2, 3 years. Because I predominantly work at a multidisciplinary, so I don't have that extra time. Okay, I understand. Now, I want to talk to you while we're here today. Um, what was the reasoning for having to surrender your license to the board in 2018? Can you please answer um, ask that question again? Yes, of course. I want to talk to you while we're here today. Um, what was the reason for having to surrender your license to the board in 2018? I surrendered my license in 2018 because I was convicted of financial elder abuse. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about that conviction. Um, who was the person that you were alleged to have committed financial elder abuse against? He was my friend and mentor. Where did you meet him? I met him at USC bookstore. And when did you meet him? In 1999. Was that when you were a student at USC? Yes. And what was this elderly gentleman's association with the University of Southern California at the time? He was teaching at the school in the biological science. Was he a professor? Yes, he was. And did you develop a, a friendship with him during the course of your education at USC? Yes. And did you maintain a relationship with him after you graduated from USC? Yes. How would you describe the relationship that you had with him? He was a parental figure for me. 
the he was my mentor, my friend, my confidant. And in the years after you left USC, how often would you see him? About once to twice a week. At some point, did this gentleman start to give you or gift you money? Yes. What was the reasoning behind his giving you money? He was helping me financially because my dad has an addiction to gambling. He borrowed money from loan sharks. And for my well-being and my family well-being, I accepted his help because I was afraid. Now, we know that you've been convicted of financial elder abuse. How did that allegation come to exist? Because he was a conservative to LA Public Guardian and LA Public Guardian felt that he did not have the mental capacity to gift it me and help me. At the time, did you ever question his mental capacities? At the time, I did not question his mental capacity because he was still teaching and self-sufficient. Looking back, I realized that I was bonded by my fear for my life and my family and my selfish needs. I understand now as that I was enabling my dad and I was enabling him because I wanted his love and acceptance. Therefore, I constantly have my friend helping me so I could have my dad love. Do you look back now and understand how you took advantage of this gentleman? Yes, I took advantage of my friend, someone who loved me when I needed love. And every day since my realization that I was selfish and greedy, that I pray for his forgiveness because I am not able to see him. In response to your conviction, were you sentenced to go to jail? Yes, I was in jail for almost 10 months. It was shortened because of my good behavior. What was going to jail like? It was hell on earth. Did you take anything good away from your experience in jail? It was a blessing in disguise. How so? In jail, I discovered God and love for myself. It was in jail that I realized why I was enabling my dad. I could have take, you know, move my family and, dis and disassociate myself from my dad, but I was seeking for his love and acceptance to fill my empty heart. Therefore, I enable my dad to continue gamble and borrow from learn sharks. How did help, or excuse me, how did finding God and religion help you reflect on what you had done? By finding God and loving myself, I understood and understand that I was taking advantage of my friend and having an unhealthy relationships as a codependent. I 
have these strong traits of wanting to solve other people's problems, lack of self-worth, and pleasing people. You've just testified that you have uh, the traits of someone who's codependent. Um, how have you worked to address that issue? By First off, my, my trait of wanting to solve other people's problems. I will pray to God when I want to help others. If I, I will help others within my name, but will, I will pray if I can't help them. I, regarding lack of self-worth, I, my heart is filled with self-love and God's love now. And when I try to please others, I ask myself, am I trespassing any healthy boundaries? Have you participated in therapy or other programs to help you grow in this regard? Yes, I went to therapy with Dr. Ferris and attended codependent meeting and I still attend weekly meetings. When you refer to codependent meetings, what is that? Codependent Anonymous is a 12 step program that mimics or Mirror Al-Anon and Alcohol Anonymous. This meeting is to help and continue helping others like myself, a codependent, to recover. It's a process. It's an ongoing process that I will continue for the rest of my life. Okay. Now, have you paid restitution to the uh, gentleman um, from whom you took money? Yes. And how much did you have to pay? Close to 50,000. Okay. And after you were released from jail early, did you then attempt to find employment? Yes. I'm... What type, what type of jobs have you worked in since you were released from jail? I worked at Costco. Um, a representative to a surgical repair company and administrator at a chiropractic office, as well as assistant. How was it working um, at Costco? It was a humbling experience and hopeful because of my record, criminal record, it was very hard to find employment and I was able to find employment within two months of my release. And you ultimately found employment at a chiropractic office, is that correct? I'm sorry, I could not hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. And you ultimately found employment at a chiropractic office, correct? Yes. Um, whose office is that? I worked at All Pro Health Center, the office where Dr. Fang and Dr. Yu worked at us. And I later work at Dr. Jeffrey Tucker office. And Dr. Tucker is going to testify on your behalf. Is that correct? Yes. Now, when you sought employment with these chiropractic offices, did you disclose your past history with the board and your conviction? Yes. What did you tell them? I told them that I was convicted of financial elder abuse and I lost the privilege of being a chiropractor. How has having the opportunity to work in a chiropractic office um, helped you through this process since you lost your license? It 
Can you please repeat that question? Yes, of course, Annie. Um, how has having the opportunity to work with Dr. Tucker and um, Dr. Feng helped you in your rehabilitative process? By I am grateful for the opportunity to work to see other patients get better. It helped my rehabilitation because it makes me hopeful for one day to be a chiropractor again. And by being hopeful, I keep myself accountable every day through self-evaluation and meditation so that I could be more mindful through thoughts, words, and action when I interact with others. Has working with Dr. Tucker and other chiropractors helped you stay abreast of chiropractic medicine? Yes. They How will. So? Huh? How so? They will inform me of the examinations for the body areas that patient are coming that patient has complaint, and they will tell me the type of treatment. Therefore, I beside reviewing from my books, I am seeing it every day. In addition to your work, have you also tried to involve yourself in the community? Yes. How have you done that? I've involved myself with the community through crisis text helpline and rescue union mission, union rescue missions and food banks. Most of my volunteer work is through the crisis text line. How has this overall experience helped you grow as a person? It made me a better person. And through my process and tools that I've learned, I feel I feel confident that I'm earning my friend forgiveness because I am living his model of being the best version of myself. Therefore, I reflect every day so the next day I could be better. And I believe that one day I will see him again and tell him I tried my best to earn his forgiveness because I betrayed him, betrayed his love. Do you I think, yes. I'm sorry, Annie, did you have something you were going to say? Yes, I keep myself accountable because I want to be able to see him and look at myself in the mirror. Do you think that the Annie of today would ever take advantage of someone like you did 10 years ago? No, I would not take advantage of my crime. I will find other solution to my problem, which is not see my dad again, move my family away, change our numbers. I did not do that 10 years ago because I wanted him to love me so my heart could be filled with love. Annie, what can you tell the board members here today to assure them that this type of incident will not occur again? I am. Uh, I. I will not do, I will not take advantage of anyone. I will not accept any monetary means from anyone. I will not 
have unhealthy relationships and how I keep myself accountable and prevent myself from doing any of this is attending weekly CODA meetings, going to church, volunteering and donating. Because when I volunteer and donate, it reminds me what where I've been. And I never want to lose my freedom and lose the privilege of being a chiropractor if given the opportunity to practice again. And why do you want to be a chiropractor again? I want to be a chiropractor because I miss the pre and post palpation after an adjustment. I miss charting notes. When patient tells me they're able to wash the hair again because their shoulder has less pain and tying their shoelace and given the opportunity to practice chiropractic again, I will share my story with future chiropractors and doctors so they could cherish their license because it's a privilege. Very good, Annie. I have no further questions, but I am guessing that the board members may. Great. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Stone, cross-examination. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just a few questions. Um, Ms. Tran, uh, when, when you were uh, uh, obtaining the money uh, from the victim um, of your crime, uh, did you know that he was a conservative? He was not a conservative. He was a professor at USC teaching and living on his own. Well, I think you, you mentioned, or your attorney might have mentioned that um, at the time uh, that he uh, provided you money, that uh, he was a conservative, and that led to the issues um, regarding your criminal case. He was a conservative after um, providing me financial help. Okay, so he, he gave you money before you knew he was a conservative? Yes. Uh, did you tell him that you needed money for the gambling debts of your father? Yes. And is that why he gave you the money? Yes. And um, do you have a relationship with your father now? Yes, I do. And um, uh, how is that relationship? And how is that relationship different now than it was in the past? It was, it is better. Through our experiences, he is a better man. Does he gamble? He does not gamble. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that you um, try to keep an eye on on healthy boundaries uh, uh, with people, such as your your, your father uh, and others. Um, can you describe for me um, what is a healthy boundary um, in in your mind? Uh, and the difference between sort of a healthy boundary and an unhealthy boundary. Healthy boundaries to me is when. I ask myself if the, I'm taking advantage of someone else and if they are taking advantage of me. And if, depending on the relationship, if that's reasonable. And I believe you mentioned that you've um, received, uh, learned, educated yourself and, and obtained tools in this regard through um, Therapy uh, is is one means. Is that correct? Yes, and self help books. And um, 
And you mentioned a 12 step program that you're involved in or something similar or akin to a 12 step program. Is that right? Yes. And when did you start that? I started the 12 step program in June. 2020. And um, have you progressed through uh, various steps in that program? I've completed that step. 12 step and it continued going and continue repeating the steps. And that's, uh, I guess, a, a codependency program. Yes. Is that right? And yes. can, can you uh, just describe for me briefly what um, codependency uh, is um, in regard to uh, that program or the other issues that you have regarding codependency? Can you describe a little bit about um, what the issue or problem is with the codependency? Codependent Anonymous is a program that um, has a, that is for those who are codependent with these specific, um, there's the traits are long, but they have low self-esteem. They try to solve other people's problem, caretaker, and want to please others and Depending on those, they're also narc some are nar narcissistic. During your 12 step uh, program regarding codependency, was there a step that you found um, particularly difficult uh, or most difficult that you could uh, describe for us? Yes, it was step four. And, and what's that step? to express your wrongdoings, how it led to that, those wrongdoings and what you did. And um, can you tell me what step that you found um, uh, most rewarding? The re rewarding part of codependent and why I continue weekly meetings is because it reminds, it gives us hope. It reminds us that this, that we could, re, there's, we can, we can recover from those traits and we're worth it. And because we're worth it, we will strive for healthy relationships with others. And I'm, I'm sorry, I think I might have interrupted you. And by having these relationships, it. It's like check and balance. It reminds you when you hear others of what they're going through, it reminds you. Of what you went through so that you won't do it again. And it also continue making me reflective. And I, th I think you mentioned you continue um, attending the 12 step program. Yes. And uh, you mentioned that you had therapy with Dr. Ferris. Uh, are you still um, seeing Dr. Ferris? Only when I need to see her. When was the last time you saw her? Earlier this year. And was that in relation to a codependence issue that you had? No. Uh, it was in relation to some other aspect of your therapy relationship with her? Yes. Have you, uh, um, had any other challenges over the past couple of years, codependent challenges, whether it was with your father or in any other relationship, any um, codependent challenges that you um, felt like you overcame uh, based on your education, your treatment, um, your understanding of codependency? Um, 
Uh, have you had any challenges that you overcame that you can describe for us? Yes, my other challenges is wanting the best for my mom's health. I have to remind myself that I'm her daughter. So I won't dictate her what the food she's eating or if she's or if she's going to her doctors. That was challenging. And um, how how were you? Uh, how did you face those challenges? By reminding myself that God gives everyone their own journey, and this is her journey, and I'm here to support when she needs it. And when she needs it, if I am capable of doing that, and if it's hurting myself and others. Before I proceed with helping her with any with any of her requests. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I don't have anything further. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Anything further on redirect? No, your honor. Thank you. All right. Um, so, next, I'll turn it to the board to see if there's any questions. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Paris. Thank you, Judge Wong. And hello, first, I, I'd just like to congratulate you on your efforts um, for rehabilitation and happy to hear that you have a relationship with your father and that he's no longer gambling. Um, it sounds like you've done a tremendous amount of work there. So, uh, thank you. My my first question is, I was wondering if you could um, kind of just clarify the duties uh, that uh, your work duties um, from the offices that you've been working at in the time that you were um, unlicensed. I was a res I help patient schedule patients, collect fees, and administrative work, and help with assisting in physio modalities. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I know you had um, mentioned uh, in your packet and I think you'd mentioned in your testimony about doing some uh, work on your evaluation and examination skills. I believe yeah. it was with Dr. Tucker. Can you can you describe that a little bit more for me? He would ask me to perform certain examinations and to report the findings. And and then he would verify those or what was, what, can you further that process for me? Yes, he would verify those. Okay. Um, and, and how many years uh, were you unlicensed? I was I stopped practicing in 2016, late 2016. Okay, so about six years at this stage. Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I saw in the packet, it mentioned that um, you were ordered to pay the board its uh, costs in the amount of 6,000, but it doesn't know if that's been paid or not. It has not been paid and I'll gladly, I will pay it. Is, is that dependent on the outcome of this hearing in your mind? No, it doesn't. And I have one other question. Um, would you be open to uh, other opportunities for the board to have assurances such as retaking the part four. There's also something called a special purposes examination. Would those be things that uh, that you'd be open to um, taking those testing requirements uh, if, if you were to get your license back or prior to you getting your license back? Yes. Thank you, I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Adams, any questions? 
Uh, yes, just a few. Again, I uh, echo uh, Chair Paris's, um, uh, you know, words that, you know, a lot of courage to come back and, and go before the board and, and uh, I commend you for the efforts you've done thus far. Uh, I just wanted to touch on real quickly the, uh, to piggyback on Dr. Paris's, uh, why, why have you not uh, paid back the board um, fees, uh, even in um, uh, incremental payments over the last uh, eight years? Or because, six years? Because I was having, um, I was living within my means. I wasn't able to do that. And I would gladly to pay the board back. And um, I didn't know I was supposed to pay the board back um, before my hearing. Okay. Um, you stated in uh, your testimony that uh, you paid back the fifty thousand to the um, to the victim of your crime. Was that the extent of your um, of your uh, theft, or was it more than that? It was more than that. Can you give me a ballpark figure? What what your your total theft amounted to? Close to 300. 300,000? Yes, close. Okay. And you paid back 50,000? Yes. And are you required to continue to pay more restitution? No. Um, I understand this question is a little bit personal. Um, was there a physical was there a physical relationship with your victim? No. Um, and do you help your father financially today? No. Will you will you be required to help him financially in the future? No. Uh, and my final question, did all the money that you stole from your victim uh, go to exclusively to uh, your father's debts with the loan sharks, or did you uh, use any of that money for your own personal gain? Most of the money came uh, went to my father gambling and loan sharks. Some of the money I did use to, for myself and my family. And what were some of these, the uses of those funds for yourself and your family? When I couldn't pay for car insurance and when I couldn't pay for books. So your testimony would be that none of the money that you use went to um, uh, you know, items that would be not of necessity. Yes. So you didn't buy rings or cars or anything like that? No, I did not. All right, thank you. I have no more questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sweet, any questions? Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Um, the, the money that you took from um, your mentor um, and that whole situation, did any of that affect your uh, practice as a chiropractor? In other words, did it affect your any of that um, issues with morality and taking advantage of someone in codependency? Did that affect your practice of chiropractic? I'm sorry, I could not hear your question. I'm sorry, this is the reporter. I'm having a hard time hearing you, sir. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Let me see. I'll try to speak up here. Is that a little better? A little bit. A little. I was just asking if um, the 
codependency issues and, and the situation that you had with your mentor taking money from from someone else did any of that um, affect how you practiced chiropractic no it did not that's really all i wanted to know thank you great uh miss cruz any questions uh, yes Let's see here, and I, I do want to kind of, kind of jump on the messaging of kind of acknowledging the one, the level of reflection, but also kind of ongoing efforts you're making to even maintain a community of accountability kind of through, through CODA. And my question is um, really on your kind of just personal readings on elder abuse. You know, it looked like you had done a, a lot of kind of personal reflection and reading to kind of really understand um, kind of the different nuances and kind of angles of it. Was this done with guidance from your therapist or kind of guidance kind of out, kind of outside of yourself or was this really just for personal reading and reflection? Well, it was going to Dr. Porteous okay. seminar that he asked me to understand why I did it and he believes that reading these articles will understand mm -hmm. could be part of my rehabilitation and it did help mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's it called? Is this kind of an on kind of is this done? Do you find yourself kind of continuing kind of that reflection or or do you find kind of much of your ongoing rehabilitation kind of through CODA? My ongoing rehabilitation is going to church volunteering and CODA. Mm -hmm. And I do occasionally read up about um, financial elder abuse. The thing is, there's not much mm -hmm. new because I've read so many articles. Mm -hmm. All right, all, right, that's it. all my other questions were already asked. Thank you. Great, thank you. Dr. Daniels, any questions? Yes, hi, good morning, just a couple. Um, hi, Ms. Tran. Thank you for all your work uh, and your testimony today. I did have a couple questions. Uh, the first question is, um, have you thought about how you will manage or deal with the um, pleaser inside of you when you, if you get your license back, if you switch from assistant back to doctor? Um, how will you manage wanting to please people and have you visualized that and what are your strategies to maintain your boundaries? I could give you an example how I remain my boundaries and how I learned through crisis text line. Through crisis text line as a counselor, I am taught to give them the necessary tools that they could self solve their problems and therefore i will constantly remind myself that everyone has their own journey god has a journey for them and i am here to assist but not over leaping because they has the, they are capable of solving their problems as well. So therefore I will be able to maintain a healthy relationship. The crisis helpline, is that on the phone or is that in person? It's the, it's through text. Okay. So. What about when you have that person that's in front of you that's needing you as a patient? And are you comfortable in maintaining your boundaries in that face to face interaction when, say, a patient needs more than you should or could give? Yes, I am confident to keep those boundaries. And I think you, um, I just, sorry, go ahead. By asking myself, am I overpassing my boundaries? And also by praying for them because 
I can't, I can't solve everyone's problem. Um, and I just wanted to confirm, I think you said that you're continuing to uh, rework the steps for codependency. Yes. And do you plan to continue that? Yes. And then uh, just last question again, just to echo uh, Dr. Paris, Dr. Adams. Um, so is there, can you just clarify a little bit more for us um, why you haven't uh, made any payments to the board in the last few years? I understand you said living within your means, but you have made other donations. So I'm just wanting a little bit more clarification. I was not aware. One, I was not aware. And two, my donation was very within, was in within my means. Okay, so you're, you weren't aware that um, there was fees to repay the board. Is that correct? Yes, at a certain time frame. I just did not know. Okay. All right. No further questions. Thank you. All right, I think that's all the board members, but I'll check one last time to see if any other uh, any board members have thought of any subsequent questions. Um, so any further questions from the board? All right, hearing none, uh, Ms. Tran, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, you're excused as a witness. And uh, Mr. Harris, um, I believe your last witness is Dr. Tucker, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And Dr. Tucker, can you hear me? Yes. All right. I just wanted to make sure we have you. Um, if I could have you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. You may put your hand down. Um, if you would please start by stating and spelling your full name for the record, please. I'm Jeffrey Tucker, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, Tucker, T-U-C-K-E-R. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Harris, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Tucker. Good morning. Um, are you a licensee of the board? Yes. And for how long have you been licensed by the board? I've been in active practice for over 40 years. And where is your practice located? West Los Angeles, California. And in addition to your private practice, are you involved in the chiropractic education world? Yes, I'm the current past president of the American Chiropractic Association Rehabilitation Council. And I have taught a lot of courses throughout the country and as well as other countries in rehabilitation and chiropractic techniques, nutrition, exercises, therapy. Very good. Um, and is it fair to say that you know Annie Mitran? Yes. When did you first meet Ms. Tran? I met Annie over two years ago, but, but before I answer that, can I please just say thank you to the entire chiropractic board for your service and what you do. And some of you may know me and some of you, this is our first time. And I just want to share with you that over two years ago, I actually applied and interviewed to be on the board of chiropractic examiners. And looking back, I think it's a really good thing. I wasn't appointed to the board because I would have had to recluse or excuse myself from being able to speak on Annie's behalf. Yet, there's really no better place that I would rather be right now, right here, than speaking on Annie's behalf and her character. And the first time I met Annie was just when COVID started. I was looking for a front office CA. She called me on the phone. It was a Saturday. She had responded to an ad for the front office job. And I was at home. I put the 
phone on speaker and my wife was listening in and Annie immediately, immediately went into telling me every detail about her past. And uh, after the call, my wife who manages over 300 employees, uh, she said she was incredibly impressed in that an employee wouldn't have to tell me or disclose the things that Annie did. So we met in my office the next week and I hired her for a probationary period, Scott. And she really did excel in that probationary period. And here we are two years later. So I feel very qualified to speak about her character. So what did Ms. Tran tell you about her past? She told me uh, ever, very openly uh, her becoming a chiropractor, her working in a multidisciplinary practice, what she did. And then she started to tell me about the relationship as she explained it with the gentleman that she met at USC, the professor, and uh, also explained her you know, family details, her dad uh, involved in gambling. I think, you know, it, it was a, a scary thing having loan sharks, you know, calling the house and uh, how she gave her money to help that situation. And she explained the incarceration, uh, the, you know, complete loss of her license, and then the things that she was doing to work on herself at that time. And uh, we were able to move forward from there. So if I may, could you clarify for the board the type of work that Ms. Tran does for your office? Yep. So uh, those, those of us that are, are chiropractors, you know, we might equate her to that front office person as well as a chiropractic assistant. So she she really uh, is remarkable at the front office. I mean, immediately she was able to bring my accounts receivable up to date, work on you know the billing, get it current. Uh, she works very very well with uh, patients in in the scheduling and rescheduling front office collections. She's routing the patients. She's really responsible for keeping me on time throughout the day, managing my uh, personal. Uh, schedule, helping me uh, manage the teaching schedule. She uh, routes patients uh, through the office uh, as I'm uh, doing exercise therapy. Uh, she's learned enough to be able to do the, the exercises with patients and, and show them for me, uh, as well as help assist in the process of some of the examinations. Uh, as time went on, you know, I wanted to be able to help sharpen her skills. Uh, and in, involve her in the exam process and what I'm doing in the orthopedic neuro tests and so on and so forth. Very good. Have you had a chance to talk to Annie about her rehabilitative efforts? Often. And what has she expressed to you as to the primary part of her rehabilitation? What does she value most? I, I think that uh, that journey through the incarceration really changed her. As I didn't know her beforehand, but she speaks of that experience. But we always talk about how she can move forward and the kind of person that she is now and who she wants to be. I think that um, as you know, uh, my role as the business owner and her supervisor, look, I've been cautious to reevaluate Annie from my risk management perspectives, um, her habits emotionally, psychologically, socially in the office. And I, I feel uh, Annie was, in, for the first six months plus, Annie would end every conversation with, thank you so much for your trust. And I finally had to say, Annie, you've earned my trust. And I'm certain that, you know, the patients are safe with you. I think that um, the only thing I want Annie to really be working on is her self-confidence. Do you intend, uh, if Annie were given her right to practice again, to potentially work with her? Yes. Uh, my biggest concern is she gets her license and she decides not to drive on the 405 freeway every day and come to work with me. <laughs>
my patients would really miss her caring demeanor and her support. Why are you taking time this morning out of your schedule to speak to the board about Annie? I, I think it's really important that I, I have had that day to day experience with her. I've, I've seen her demonstrate good habits, showing up early to work every day. Something particularly special about Annie is her employers that I appreciate is, you know, that once I ask her to do something, and I'm sure you can all relate to this, but when I ask Annie to do something, order supplies or order vitamins or supplements or call a patient, I don't have to look back over my shoulder and make sure that it was done. I know she's going to handle it. So this consistency has given me a lot of confidence in her with her. And I wanted to be able to convey that to the board. Very good. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, cross examination, Mr. Stone. Uh, yeah, just uh, briefly, uh, thank you very much for your uh, testimony and your time uh, today, doctor. Um, you mentioned in, in a letter that you wrote in support of a petitioner that over the course of working together, you've been faced with difficult situations with her and you've seen her research and process risks, rules and regulations to ultimately make consistent, good, sound business decisions. And I was wondering if you could give us some uh, concrete or particular examples of difficult situations where, ha where you've seen um, the petitioner research and process the risk, rules and regulations to make uh, a, a good uh, therapeutic decision. I know at that time when I was writing it, there was there was one or two very specific examples, and forgive me if I don't remember them exactly, but I believe they were around uh, coding uh, was part of it. Possibly rebilling was another one. I I hate to guess what those were, but I I'm pretty sure it was it was around coding. Uh, on that note, I can tell you that if if we have a difficult case or somebody that comes in with a diagnosis that I'm not sure about what the best treatment is, uh, I ask Andy to help do some research to let, let's figure that out. Let's come up with a strategy and a plan in some of these difficult and challenging patients. So her participation is, is helpful uh, doing research, but there, there have been times when we sit down and we, we, may, we may talk about, uh, okay, where, where are we at with this, this patient? What else do we need to do? Who's the best referral source for this patient to go to? Um, during your work with her uh, or in your discussions with her regarding either work or, or her personal life, um, have you either witnessed, uh, seen, or uh, discussed with uh, Ms. Tran um, uh, any codependent issues that uh, she was faced with? that you saw her uh, struggle with and overcome um, or otherwise uh, address anything in particular to the codependency issue she has? I, I haven't seen that. I always find her to be very warm and kind with the patients. She's really good under stress. Uh, she's yet restless to help. So I don't, I don't see it as the codependency part. She's organized and efficient. She's reliable. Uh, so you haven't seen her um, uh, or you haven't discussed with her any struggles that she's had with um, battling a codependent aspect of her uh, personality in terms of either the work that she's had with you or in um, any other aspect of her life? No, she's only, she's only shared that she's going to the meetings. We have not had a need to talk about the specifics. Uh, thank you. I don't have anything further. Right, Mr. Uh, Harris, anything on redirect? No, Your Honor, thank you. All right, uh, next I'll check with the board. Um, Dr. Paris, any questions? I, I do have a question. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank Dr. Tucker for taking time out to come today. And um, we, don't, we don't always get 
um, to see the, uh, you know, we don't always get to hear the support face to face. It's usually a written letter. And so to take your time out today and, um, you know, to have you here, you're a uh, well known, well respected um, chiropractor in, in the um, in the profession. So um, that weighs heavy for me. So uh, I do have one question and you mentioned it actually, and I think it, it surrounds the um, kind of the self confidence in being able to return to practice. And where do you think that stems from? Is that a clinical confidence or do you think that is just um, someone who who's trying to uh, and making great efforts to kind of rehabilitate and get back and and just hasn't fully arrived, you know, in their own mind? What are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pierce. I, I honestly think that she has confidence as a chiropractor. I that her level of uh, thought process is as a practitioner is there. The confidence probably came from being incarcerated and and having that type of a, a schedule. And I don't really know what goes on in there. I can't imagine, but I, I think that's that's part of it. And I um, I just have a follow up. What would your thoughts be um, on us providing assurances to the public by um, incorporating some sort of uh, further testing through the NBCE has a special purposes exam and a part four exam? From your view, um, would that be something that you see would be helpful? I I know that through my efforts, I've been working with Annie to keep her up to date on all the essentials functions of what we do in the office. So uh, I imagine she would do really well if she needed to take those tests. I, I, I think it, it's fine. I have no further questions and thank you again for um, good to see you again and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Adams, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Tucker, for uh, for being here today. Your presence is uh, is well received. <clears throat> um, just a, a question: How would you rate uh, um, Ms. Tran's uh, skills um, as a practitioner, as a her chiropractic adjusting skills? Oh, good question. Uh, thanks, Dr. Adams. She, without her license, she's not allowed to do manipulation. So we're very clear, you know, what those boundaries are in the office. Uh, so uh, let's think of all of the things uh, that she can do. So she uh, can do exercise therapy. Uh, she assists me if I'm doing therapies or modalities such as uh, a, a laser treatment or a shockwave treatment. She'll she'll assist me be there while I'm doing it. Uh, she may do some soft tissue technique, uh, for example, you know, pin and stretch type of technique with me and assist in that as well. So uh, I personally, on a personal note, uh, I have her practice on me, but we're not doing manipulation or anything that's outside of the scope of that practice. Do you feel a sense of uh, her confidence in that process in uh, in setting up and and doing what what it is that you do? Do you feel that there's that confidence there? Absolutely. Skill levels are there, motor skills, those aspects. Yes. yes. Skills. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sweet, any questions? No questions. Thank you for your time, Dr. Tucker. Ms. Cruz, any questions? No questions. Thank you for your time also, Dr. Tucker. Dr. Daniels, any questions? No questions. Thank you. All right. I think that's each of the board members, but I'll double check to see if anyone's thought of any subsequent questions. Um, any further questions from the board? 
All right, hearing none, thank you very much, Dr. Tucker, for your time. You are excused as a witness. Thank you for coming. Um, Mr. Harris, any further um, evidence? No, Your Honor, the petitioner rests. Okay, uh, so closing arguments, Mr. Stone? No, we don't have any uh, argument uh, to provide uh, in uh, relation to whether um, reinstatement is um, appropriate or not. We leave that in the board's uh, sound discretion uh, within the disciplinary guidelines. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris, your closing argument. Thank you. Members of the board, thank you again. And I'll try to be a, a quick uh, knowing that your time is valuable. Ms. Tran is clearly humbled by her past. Um, this is someone who takes full responsibility for her conduct. She took advantage of a friend that she knew for over a decade, um, who at some point was deemed a conservatee late in the relationship. And Ms. Tran, unfortunately, was blind to how she breached the boundaries of that relationship in accepting monies from him. And she paid the price. She had to go to jail. Hell on earth was her testimony, but she was released early. She has the support of her probation monitor at the time or uh, probation officer, excuse me, better term. And she immediately invested in the community and in herself. She went back to work, having humbling experiences going from being a doctor of chiropractic medicine to a seasonal clerk at Costco. And now having to work in a chiropractic office where she can't be called doctor, but she's continued to invest. She's gone to therapy. She's go gone to codependence anonymous. She's done extensive reading and she has the support of dozens of individuals, both within and without the chiropractic profession. Dr. Tucker is just one of several chiropractors who support her petition for reinstatement. And he's just one of many character witnesses that speak to her credibility, her honesty, her remorse, and her ability to self-reflect to know how she violated her past relationship and why she is now safe to practice as a chiropractor again. At the start of this proceeding, I suggested that we would be asking you to issue or reissue Ms. Tran a license to make her Dr. Tran officially once again. And I'm going to ask that of you and bring to your attention just a couple things. One, the order for repayment to the board was conditioned in the default, excuse me, in the surrender that she signed on her reissuance. It was at the time of reissuance that she would pay and she's more than happy to pay. And we would hope that if she needs the opportunity to pay with a payment plan, that she has given that opportunity. She's also more than willing to take any tests and even serve on probation if necessary, so as to give you the peace of mind that she can safely be a practitioner in the state of California. We hope that you will find the testimony of Dr. Tucker and Ms. Tran compelling enough to reissue her a license. And I want to thank you once again for your time. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harris. Thank you for your time and your presentation. Um, so that concludes the hearing on this matter. Um, the records closed and uh, the matter is submitted um, and we are off the record. Um, and so, um, Mr. Harris says, I, I believe, you know, of the process, the um, board after hearing the remaining matters on calendar will deliberate um, in closed session um, about this matter and. Um, a decision will be issued um, later on in the future. So there, there won't be a, a um, decision issued today. Um, and then, of course, if we were in here in person today, um, the court reporter would be filling out a form um, in case you wanted a copy of the transcript. Uh, but since we're not in, in person, um, my office will, uh, will send you one, if not uh, later today, tomorrow. Um, are there any questions? No, Judge Wong, thank you very much. And again, members of the board, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Good luck. Um, and Madam court, report, Madam court Reporter, when you have a moment, if I could get a page estimate.
Yes, the page estimate uh, is 58 pages. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Paris, shall we proceed to the next matter or does the board wish to take a break? I think we might um, maybe take five ish, maybe five to 10 minutes, let everyone uh, get a use of facilities and if that's okay. That's perfectly acceptable. Okay. Um, why don't we take, why don't we come, we take eight minutes and we'll come back at 1040. Very good. Okay. Thank you. This is a moderator and while we are on break, uh, Ginger Kelly, would you like to do a quick mic and camera check? Hello. Hi, yes, we can hear you. Would you like to try your camera as well? Sure. Perfect. I can see and hear you. So um, you're set to go and we're back from break. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
Seeing it's 1041, Judge Wong, would you like us to do a quick roll call before we um, get going again? Um, it's not necessary. Um, I'll, I'll do it on the record um, unless, unless you want to. No, if you're going to, if you'll do it on the record, that's fine. Okay, very good. Okay. Shall we go ahead and start? Yeah, it looks like we're ready to go. All right, very good. Um, Madam Court Reporter, if uh, we could go on the record. Uh, so I'll call the Jeffrey Richard Mars matter, um, and we're back on the record before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California, in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of surrendered license by Jeffrey Richard Mars, M-A-R-R-S. It is agency case number AC-2013-957. And it is OAH number 20220907780. My name is Corin Wong, uh, and I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, and I have been assigned to preside over this matter. Uh, to establish a quorum of the board for the record, I request that each member respond audibly after his or na her name is called. Uh, Dr. Paris? Present. Dr. Adams? Present. Mr. Sweet? Present. Ms. Cruz? Present. Dr. Daniels? Present. Let the record reflect that a quorum of the board is present. Uh, next, if I may take the appearances of counsel, starting with uh, the Deputy Attorney General, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, uh, board members, uh, petitioner, and counsel. Uh, this is Deputy Attorney General Jeff Stone uh, appearing on behalf of the people of the state of California pursuant to government code section 11522. Good morning. Um, Ginger Kelly, attorney for petitioner Jeffrey Mars. Thank you. Um, and um, Ms. Kelly, uh, were you um, able to hear earlier when I kind of went over the procedural setup for the hearings? I was, Your Honor. Okay. And did you have any questions about that? I do not. Thank you. All right. And if any pop up, just let me know. Thank you so much. All right. So, Mr. Stone, if you would like to um, provide your summary statement or documents, whichever you would like to do first. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, as for uh, the documents, we have the uh, notice of hearing and the declaration of service. Uh, we have the um, continuing education log uh, prepared by board, board staff, and we have petitioner's application for reinstatement um, uh, and supporting documentation, which is at BCE 1 through BCE 169. And we have certified copies of petitioner's prior disciplinary documents on file with the board, and those are at uh, BCE 170 through 193, and those are the documents that we would like to submit. Uh, into evidence, Your Honor. All right. So I will mark the request to set as Exhibit One, and then Exhibit Two consists of the August 12, 2022, um, memorandum to the board, uh, the continuing education log, and the petition for reinstatement of revoked license and supporting documents. And then three consists of the decision and order, stipulated surrender of license and order. Decision on petition for interim suspension order, accusation, and order restricting practice as a chiropractor. And then four is um, a notice of hearing and memorandum to Mr. Stone. And then fifth uh, consists of petitioner's supplemental documents. Um, so first, Ms. Kelly, any objection to one um, and or four for jurisdictional purposes only? No objection. All right, those exhibits will be so admitted. And then Ms. Kelly, any objection to two, three, and or five uh, for all purposes? No, no objection. And, and those exhibits will be so admitted. All thank right, you. Mr. Stone, whenever you're ready. Um, uh, thank you, and, and thank you for the supplemental documents. I do have those, those are lab dates labeled 194 through uh, 200, um, uh, the, the supplemental ethics boundaries plan. Thank you for that. Uh, generally speaking, we have here um, petitioner uh, uh, Jeffrey Richard Mars 
uh, on or about January 29th of 1996, the board issued Doctor of Chiropractic License Number DC 24168 uh, to Mr. Mars. Uh, the license was surrendered to the board effective August 19th, 2016. Um, that uh, surrender was in relation to an underlying matter uh, uh, in the dec decision and order in case number AC 2013-957, uh, which was effective August 19th. 2016. Uh, the accusation was filed on October 14th, 2015, and that accusation um, uh, set forth three causes for discipline. Those causes for discipline uh, were relating to criminal conviction for sexual battery um, uh, pursuant to Business and Profession Code uh, Section 490 and California Code of Regulations Title 16, Section 317. Uh, subdivision G, uh, the second cause for discipline was unprofessional conduct, uh, uh, engaging in conduct, uh, which endangers the health, welfare and safety of the public, uh, at California code of regulations, title 16, section 317 subdivision E and unprofessional conduct commission of acts of sexual misconduct with patients. Uh, that's business and profession code 726 and California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Sections 316, Subdivisions C, and uh, 317, Subdivisions, uh, Subdivision M. Uh, the uh, underlying uh, discipline related to, um, as I mentioned, a criminal conviction and unprofessional conduct, uh, the sexual battery in this case was uh, Penal Code Section 243.4, Subdivision E1. Um, it did relate to uh, two uh, patients, sexual battery of, of two patients, uh, while a petitioner was a, a doctor of chiropractic. Um, the records also indicate uh, that um, in the underlying investigation uh, that uh, petitioner uh, told the officer that he had uh, sexual relations uh, in addition with the two victims mentioned with uh, six other uh, patients. Uh, the underlying action in the accusation there was a uh, interim suspension order that was uh, initially issued uh, as well. Uh, in the underlying criminal matter, uh, it did go to a trial uh, by jury, uh, and there was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a, a conviction. Uh, my understanding is that there was a six-month jail uh, sentence uh, that was served uh, under a general sentence of one year. There have been, uh, you'll see in the records, uh, some uh, diagnosis of petitioner uh, by a forensic psychologist uh, in relation to uh, diagnosis of uh, sexual paraphilia and professional, professional sexual uh, mitochondria. Um, and there's treatment uh, records that have been submitted uh, as well. Uh, there was cost recovery that was ordered in the matter in the amount of $5,585 uh, prior to the issuance of a newer reinstated license. And those costs have been paid to the board in full as of August 2nd, 2018. And uh, we also have uh, continuing education, uh, which has been uh, provided, uh, which is sufficient uh, continuing education to fulfill the continuing education requirements for each year the license uh, was surrendered, that's 2016 through 2022, consisting of 120, 124 hours of education, uh, 12 hours of ethics, and 24 hours of, of mandatory subject areas. Uh, and that is a summary of the uh, matter uh, before us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Uh, Ms. Kelly, do you have any additional documents you wanted to have uh, marked? No, Your Honor. Okay. And did you have any witnesses other than um, Mr. Mars? No, just Mr. Mars. Okay. And uh, did you wish to call him at this time? Um, I would like to make a brief opening statement, if that's okay. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Ginger Kelly. I'm the attorney for um, Mr. Mars, um, the morning board members, Your Honor, and the Attorney General. Dr. Mars comes before this board today um, after nearly a decade elapsing of, uh, from his conduct. And I can submit to you that Dr. Mars has exceptional rehabilitation and remorse. He voluntarily surrendered his license while working diligently for the past 
eight years on insight, counseling, and rehabilitation, which has been provided to all of you with his numerous documentation. I will acknowledge uh, up front that this is a very, very serious case, and I'm not minimizing it in any way at all, and neither is Dr. Mars by anything that we, we say in this hearing. Um, 10 years has elapsed and it was originally Dr. Mars was arrested for felony conduct. Um, that was reevaluated by the prosecutor in this case when they interviewed the witnesses and determined that it was misdemeanor conduct, um, a sexual battery of misdemeanor conduct. He did go to trial um, at the time. He was a bit confused on the laws of consent, which I know he explains in his answers to the questions, but today he is extremely aware of all of these rules and regulations. Also, um, he's worked very, very hard in counseling and struggled for many years to come to terms with his actions, his remorse, his apologies, and to rehabilitate himself, which he has done. Uh, in 2018, um, I'm sorry, strike that. In, in 2020, he was um, granted a Dismissal by the court under penal code section 1203.4 and that was based on his um, perfect um, adherence to all of the criminal penalties, his payments, his conduct. And so now, as, as we sit here today, he no longer has that criminal record. Um, additionally, he has been in therapy for nearly a decade. Um, the specifics are laid out in our papers. Uh, he's commit, he's uh, been committed to numerous boundaries classes where he has developed um, immense insight to his actions, tools, and um, different skill sets in order to um, address his mental health issues, which he has done successfully. He has had counseling specific to the violations. And one of the most, um, I think, um, amazing things that Dr. Mars has continued to do. He is the, he has, this man has the best attitude towards his rehabilitation. He is very committed to his church, to his volunteer work, to helping others. And he does that on a daily basis. And he's been doing it prior to, to this, this, this event, but he approached it in a different manner after this. And he realized that, you know, his ego and his mental health issues and all of these um, issues needed to be addressed before he could actually help others in any, any positive way. Understanding the main goal of, of the board is the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Um, we submit that once you hear Dr. Mars and review the packet, we would submit to you that you would find that he is entitled to, to receive his license back. And then I'd like to call um, Dr. Mars. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Mars, if I could have you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may hit, put your hand down. Uh, if I could have you start by stating and spelling your full name for the record, please. Jeffrey Richard Mars, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-R-I-C-H-A-R-D-M-A-R-R-S. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Mars. How are you? Very well, thank you. And let me just start with this. How how old are you today, Dr. Mars? Fifty six. And where did you go to chiropractic school? I'm sorry. This is the reporter. I didn't hear your answer. I'm having trouble. Also, I apologize. I am fifty six years old. And where did you go to chiropractic school? Los Angeles College of Chiropractic. And when did you graduate and become a chiropractor? April of 1995. And you were licensed in that year, April of 1990? The following January in 1996. Okay. Um, how long did you practice before you surrendered your license? Approximately 20 years. Can you describe your practice during those 20 years? What kind of practice did you have? It varied a, a fair amount during that time. Um, I started off by working for another chiropractor in a, a, a small clinic and 
and then in um, 2003, uh, moved out and opened my own clinic. Um, that was a single doctor practice, um, which eventually grew into a multidisciplinary uh, clinic um, where we had um, some acupuncturists and a massage therapist um, come and work in the clinic as well and other chiropractors. And so it, the, it grew quite a bit. Okay, thank you. So you surrendered your license in 2016. Um, when did you actually begin your rehabilitation? Later in 2016, um, I believe it was in November. Um, well, actually, no, forgive me. It was, uh, uh, actually, I, I do believe it was immediately that, um, that I did begin it. Uh, and uh, please forgive me. I before I actually uh, went to uh, uh, serve my sentence, I started it, and then I I, uh, but with a different uh, counselor, I continued it after I uh, got out. And so that would be approximately two thousand and fifteen, fourteen. Uh, two thousand fifteen. Okay. And what what did that look like? What was what did you? How did you begin your rehabilitation? Facilitation. What did you do? Uh, I went to a uh, a professional counselor, um, a ther a professional therapist for uh, for private sessions, and um, later I I went to a forensic psychologist. And uh, after I got out and thought, okay, well, I I knew I had issues at that point um, that I needed to address. I wanted to know, well, okay. Um, before I was on the defense and so forth, but um, then I um, I discovered no, um, I'm no longer on the defense. I need to see what's going on in here, and so um, went to the forensic psychologist to see, you know, am I am I a terrible person? Am I am I crazy or uh, or or just what? Because I I want to get down to the bottom of this. And after the evaluation, um, she recommended. Um, another therapist to go in and uh, see on a regular basis, which I did, um, starting with private sessions and then moving into um, when she thought I was ready to a group session and uh, where I continued for some years after that. And what, what did you learn through these therapy sessions about yourself? Oh, boy. Um, I know that I know that's a, a big question, but you can just you can answer it in parts like, you know, okay. There, yeah, it, it is hard to know where to start. Um, uh, it's, uh, I, they started digging in from when I was a child and it, uh, it sounds, I mean, we, we've seen it all on TV. It sounded like, oh, I'm going to go in. It's a, well, but, but I did, it's, it's for real and, uh, discovered things about myself. Um, I, I would the way that I viewed the world, the way that I, uh, I mean, those around me and so forth, uh, the way that I engaged it and so on and so forth was, uh, was really, um, uh, not a, not a good way, not a, not a healthy way to do it. I, I, you know, I felt like I was, well, I guess in competition with, uh, with those around me, not in a, I'm not sure how to describe that exactly. It would be like, um, I'd see people that were, I didn't judge necessarily people that were not doing as well as me, but I felt like, uh, I felt insecure and inadequate because of, um, every, everybody that was more successful than me. Um, I, um, boy, howdy, I was passive aggressive. I would, uh, let people heap things on me because of my insecurities and my feeling of inadequacies. And, uh, and then I would, um, become aggressive in, you know, passive aggressive ways. And, okay. uh, so I learned to, uh, I learned to become assertive, which is an art that I, you know, uh, it's it's an art because because uh, I don't want to be uh, I don't want to be aggressive, but neither do I want to be passive. Um, but uh, I was able to uh, discover and address some of the root issues that led to me um, feeling the way I did that uh, made it easier for me to act the way that I did. 
Um, I learned about uh, the rehab also included uh, going to a boundary seminar. Um, it's led by a psychologist uh, with Professional Boundaries Incorporated. Um, that's where I had been told about the fiduciary duty and uh, and what it meant, but I and I thought I understood it, but comparatively, I had no idea. Um, I <laughs> I learned about it, uh, truly learned about it there. And that's when any defensiveness, I, I think that was left to just went out the door. Um, I had, uh, I learned that when I, you know, originally I, I confessed to police immediately um, and I took full responsibility. I thought at least verbally, I took full responsible for this responsibility for everything that happened. I thought I was uh, doing really well and that I actually had, but uh, later I, I fought like a, um, like a banshee because um, I, they, I thought they were uh, um, exaggerating things because they said he pushed himself on these patients. And I, and I, you know, I said to myself, no, I didn't, that it was consensual. And uh, because I thought it was consensual. Well, um, they were correct. Um, there is no such thing with a doctor patient relationship. Um, going through that discovery was, uh, was enormous for me. And, uh, so going through that, uh, uh, that regular, uh, meeting process with a therapist and with, uh, other men that had had, uh, similar violations, um, I can't think of much of an, really of any areas of my life that weren't impacted by it. So, okay. so let me, let me, let me, let me uh, stop you there. So uh, areas of your life that weren't impacted by it. So how did this impact? Obviously you're married, you're happily married. Is that right? Yes. And your wife yes, has I stood am. by you during all of this. Is that correct? Yes, she has. And how did that affect your family life? How did you, how did you rectify that? How did you make amends and restitution to your family for your actions? By throwing myself at their feet and doing anything they asked, um, my children uh, merely stood by us and uh, stood by me and, and stood by us in, in this whole thing. And they did not ask anything of me, um, but I just tried to be a, a better father um, than I had been, uh, realizing that um, that my behavior had been uh, very harmful to them seeing it and uh, and, uh, and what it had done, but then discovering, well, I should have been a better father in this way and that way and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I did everything uh, that my wife asked me to do uh, to show that, that I truly was sorry and that um, I would do whatever it took to uh, earn and then uh, keep on earning or not keep on earning, but uh, not betray her trust that she placed in me. Okay. Um, let's go, let's go to your criminal case. Um, you were convicted of a misdemeanor. Is that correct? I'm, I couldn't hear you. Can you. Yes, it is correct. Thank you. Um, how, how, how have you dealt with the harm that you've caused your patients? I mean, how, how have you dealt with that? And I know you answer that in your, in, in the questions, but can you explain, you know, the remorse and the, what you've done about it? I wrote, uh, I did not write a letter of apology to, to directly apologize to them. I did not do that immediately because there, uh, when the, the case first started, there was a restraining order. And so I could not contact them. And so I did not, but after I was released, I did write letters of apology to them. Um, as for, as for how I handled the dealing with it, uh, for myself, if that's what you're asking, yeah. then I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, it was, that was a, a load that I, I didn't realize how heavy a load it was. It was, um, it was a, just a, a weight around my neck that a uh, little like an anchor that, uh, kept me from going forward. It was, it was really staggering. Um, I felt like, uh, I was not supposed to be happy. I was not supposed to deserve 
anything and uh, so on and so forth. Be because, um, of because of what you did? Because of what I did. Yes, it was crushing. It, it, uh, um, I had a friend who said one time he described something to me because I think he saw the weight that I uh, was under. And um, he said uh, he had a friend who had committed suicide. And he said, I would never do that. But he said, but I've seen that door. And uh, and I thought that's a really good way to that's a really good way to put it. Um, I I had seen that door, and I would never do that. But it was it was that bad. And I had two people, uh, my father and a friend that was uh, close to me, come to me within a week of each other and tell me that I needed to set it aside and not live with it. Um, my dad just wanted me to be happy again. And uh, the friend said he'd like to see me happy, but it wasn't doing anyone around me any uh, any good for me to carry that with me. And so I, I literally just had to set it aside and it wasn't a once and done process. Um, I had, I have to set it to the side in order to move forward uh, for uh, the sake of those around me and for my own sake too, because it's uh, not, I realize it's destructive and it's uh, it's not going to do uh, the victims or anyone else any good. And so I'm I'm not proud of what I did. I'm, uh, I feel uh, terrible about it. It's difficult to talk about and yet I have faced it and I, and I do face it. Um, and so that's, that's how I've decided to handle it. And that's how I have been handling it. Do you think that therapy has, has helped you and in what way? Oh, it, it really is hard to, it's hard to say how it hasn't helped me um, in engaging with the world. I used to, um, again, just swallow everything and, uh, you know, be, be a doormat. And, uh, but then, um, but it, uh, it, that didn't, I thought it was, uh, the way you were supposed to be, you're just, you know, supposed to be nice and, uh, and take things. Um, well, I, I don't think that that's, I don't think that's the case at all. You're, you know, I mean, you're not supposed to, you know, uh, demand your way everywhere you go, but neither are you going to do the person you're, um, that you're with any good by by being passive and letting them overstep boundaries that you should have. So, so I now have boundaries around me, and so that uh, and it's I, I think it's in all my relationships really where um, I can I can be assertive and comfortable with it at this point. And that took a while to get there, but uh, when I discovered that I needed to do that, it it has changed the way that, uh, oh, and the way that I, I see the people around me, I can now be confident in myself and, and just be happy for somebody else who's more successful than I am. And the uh, world's too big a place uh, to be in competition with everyone. And so, um, so but it's a lot more uh, uh, healthy. Um, to be everyone's, you know, you're not uh, to not to view it as uh, a contest like that fellow is uh, taller, better looking, and more intelligent, more successful, or whatever. But rather to um, just be happy for them and say, you know, I'm I'm very pleased, very satisfied with where I am as well. So I'm happy for both of us. We can all win. It seems like you've done a lot of work in um, therapy and all of the, all of the seminars that you've attended in order to address your issues. So I commend you. Um, you described earlier that you developed some valuable insight about patients being able to consent. Can you can you explain that? Yes. Um, before I thought that um, if you were with another adult, um, I knew that it was wrong to um, have relations um, await other than those with my wife. Um, but I thought I considered them affairs, which are still bad, but I, I didn't realize that they cannot consent. Um, it's impossible because of the power differential. And I eschewed the, the power differential thinking, well, I don't wanna act like I'm better than people. Let's all, let's be, 
I don't know if egalitarian is the word for it, but um, we can be on an on an equal level playing field. Well, that's that's harmful to the patient, and uh, and so I didn't realize that. So I would embrace that, and uh, and I and I do where it's appropriate now. With uh, although I'm not in a fiduciary. Uh, uh, I don't have a fiduciary duty to to those that I work with now. I mean, other uh, other adults and so forth. But um, but I still uh, embrace that as helpful to the relationship uh, of a between a doctor and a patient. And uh, there's there's nothing to eschew. I I'm, I embrace that philosophy because I, I see it as entirely. Um, Entirely, entirely for the uh, the patient's benefit, and so that was that was real life under. Okay, um, in the papers that that you filed, uh, you describe a lot of community service that you do. Can you can you uh, elaborate a little bit on what you've done for the past eight or nine years, community service wise? Um, I have been working at our church an awful lot and uh, under a number of roles. Um, uh, it's. It started with uh, just uh, gardening type stuff, uh, yard cleanup, uh, tree trimming, uh, cutting down or removing trees and uh, other things like that. Um, and and around the community on occasions and then uh, grew to where I, I still do that, but um, I've become a deacon, which um, I'll, I'll continue with what I've done in the past, but I'll also uh, go and uh, work on crews to set up tables for events, set up, you know, physical things for, uh, uh, events and so forth at our church. Um, cause it's a, it's a large church and, um, uh, and, um, uh, I work at a VFW and I've done some of the same things at VFW to make it a, um, a more peaceful, relaxing, beautiful place was my hope for the, uh, veterans. And what's, so, sorry, let, me, let me stop you. What's VFW? Oh, uh, veterans of foreign wars. They have okay. coasts around the country, and uh, we have a lot of uh, aging veterans there. Um, the oldest was in the Korean War at this point. Um, my father uh, went there. We started taking him there, and uh, he became a member, and uh, my wife and I became lifetime members of the auxiliary, um, and we've donated some to the post. Um, I had a friend bring a tractor in and do some uh, do some work to prepare for some trees and we planted some trees in the back so that it would make a, a nice little garden spot just for you know for the um, vets to enjoy and uh, and have a place to kind of escape from uh, things you might say and uh, and recharge their batteries and then um, we began working in the kitchen uh, just you know, serving tables and so forth. But now, um, every, uh, you know, two Wednesdays, two or three Wednesdays a month, um, we go down and, uh, and cook, uh, tacos and, uh, and make dinner for the, the veterans as well. And with your service with the veterans is, um, 1 of your plans, if you're reinstated is to is was to provide pro bono. Services to them can, can you explain that a little bit? Yes, um. Especially with uh, with the older veterans, and uh, and some would fall into an underserved community um, category. Um, I would we would continue. We plan to continue what we've been doing, and um, we're looking for ways to to. And we're always looking for ways to improve it as well. Um, but I would see them in in the office, and I would provide uh, uh, services to them in an office setting uh, to and those that. Free of charge, free of charge, so that they uh, so that they are are better served. Okay, um, let's talk about your chaperone policy that we submitted. Tell me, tell me how that that was initiated, when it was initiated, and and uh, how it went for the time that it was in place. Um, another doctor who had a chaperone policy um, shared with me what he had done, and and uh, we instituted it back in. I believe it's 2012. We uh, we did it immediately after the um, after the accusations, and um, <clears throat> and I did it for the remainder of my time uh, seeing patients for the right. next three years. And so you saw patients for three years after the accusations using utilizing the chaperone policy. 
I, I did continue seeing patients on a regular basis. And, and uh, that went on for over three years. Uh, yes, and I had, um, I had, I always had a chaperone with me. Um, the the chaperone was trained. They knew what had happened. They knew um, of the of the charges uh, against me, and uh, they knew uh, to watch for any behavior that would be um, that would be harmful to a patient or uh, harmful or inappropriate in any way, shape, or form. And okay. so, okay, that's another question that I have. Let me just back up for a second. Um, the knowledge that others have. So, does your your is your church been made aware of your actions and your convictions? Oh yes, yes. Uh, uh, what about the veterans? Painfully aware, and uh, the veterans as well. The uh, commander of the post is uh, he just retired. Um, he's a, a CHP officer, and so um, he's very aware. And uh, and so yes. And these pe and these people are all willing to give you another chance to prove yourself. Yes, um, in fact, I was, um, I was restored by our elder board um, last year uh, completely and they went through and, uh, and, and I told multiple pastors because it's been going on for quite a while. And so I told each of our pastors during that time, uh, four different occasions about what had happened and this last time uh, the pastor and um, all of the elders as well, and uh, after which um, they they gave me a like it's there's even a letter about it a full restoration. So, okay, thank you very much. So, talk let's talk about your employment since you surrendered your license in 2016. Can you describe what you've done and how you've kept up with chiropractic practices? Um, the occupations have varied a little bit for a while. Um, I I immediately started, uh, I, I went back to carpet installations and um, repairs uh, advertised on Craigslist and uh, and picked up any odd jobs that I could. And um, I tried uh, doing some voiceovers for a while, but uh, starved doing that. And so I, I that that didn't work too well for me, but, um, but I continued with construction type work and um, I have a sister who is a real estate broker, and um, I started working with her on purchasing properties and rehabilitating them. Uh, re I've, we've done some remodels. I've done lots of construction work with that, picked up some new skills, um, some, some uh, tools that I had never used and, uh, and have gone to town on some properties. We own a couple of rentals and um and i've uh remodeled mm, partially remodeled both of those and uh and other houses um we just purchased another piece of real estate uh that needs uh remodeling and we're about to start that process so okay. that's that's been keeping me uh pretty busy if your chiropractic license is reinstated, explain to the board and to the judge and to the prosecutor um, what you, what's your plan. What do you what do you plan to do? I understand you're going to help the veterans and you're going to do some pro bono work, but what would be your plan for a practice? The the plan would be um, to return to practice with not only a chaperone, but with because the the people that know me and uh, uh, the people uh, the my my family, um, my friends, my, uh, those at the BFW and, and at church, the ones that I work with, they trust me, but no one here other than you knows me. And so you can't, I know you can't just take my word for it, um, that I would, uh, do well and that the public would be, um, protected. And so, um, to have oversight, I would, uh, that's why, I've, um, we put together through, uh, professional boundaries, put together that um, that boundary protection plan where it is verifiable. It would, I would be under um, tremendous scrutiny. And yeah. so that, um, so that I would return to practice with those, um, those protections for the public in place. Okay. And so. Um, and you uh, would submit if the board were to, uh, set forth any conditions such as uh, probation or working for a mentor or having a supervisor of your practice or 
taking numerous difficult tests, you're a, a willing to abide by anything that the board feels is appropriate. Anything that the, the board wishes me to do, I would do. Thank you, Dr. Mars. I have nothing further. Mr. Stone, cross examination. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, a few questions. Um, I, I know that in the criminal case and in regard to the um, underlying discipline, uh, there was um, a related uh, sexual misconduct with with two patients, um, and then. As I mentioned before, it, it indicated in the police report that that you talked about um, having sexual relations with six other uh, patients. Can can you tell us how many patients uh, of yours you had sexual uh, contact with um, while you were practicing? With with all of those stated, and there were um, there were four others that I had um, that I had touched in a sexual manner, um, and. That was it. So, what's the total number? Well, the total number of patients that you had inappropriate sexual contact with. Yes. Yes, it was 12 patients. The 2, um, in 2012, and then the 6 before, um, that I, that I talked about and I. I told, I believe I told the officer, um, I'm pretty sure I, I did at the time. And there were, there were, um, four others that, uh, that I had touched inappropriately. If have you, um, I, I know that you've taken classes or seminars, um, uh, uh, and continuing education type of issues regarding boundaries. Have you, um, yourself undertaken therapy? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And, and um, how many therapists have you had? Three. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, it was three. And, and when did your therapy begin? 2015. And are you still currently undergoing therapy? No, I'm not. I, um, I graduated. Uh, and received a certificate of rehabilitation from um, Sharon, the uh, the last one that I had been seeing for uh, the last you know, approximately three and a half years, and um, and then um, I stopped therapy because because I had graduated, I I earned that certificate, and uh, and I had I'm I'm still employing what I uh, what I learned in the classes, and. I'd be happy to return to them. I it's uh, it it was it takes about a half a day every week um, to to go there and is very expensive, and I I don't have a lot of money and so that's where um, I I hadn't continued. I would be happy to to um, start those again and uh, the professional boundaries as well, where um, peers would uh, medical doctors and others. Uh, would be there and could speak directly to uh, and and understand situations that I'm in. Now, um, I'm just trying to get an understanding of you know, you're talking about classes and graduating. Um, did your therapy consist of a certain like course of of uh, classes? Forgive me. Um, group session would be a better description. And okay. so. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So, so you had group group sessions and there was a certain amount of them and then they give you a certificate or graduation at some point when you complete a number of classes. Is that right? Oh, I, I see what you mean. Um, not because you completed a certain number, but because you, uh, completed, uh, the. All of the checkpoints, you might say, you've acknowledged uh, what you've done. You've uh, addressed the issues. Um, you've uh, you you couldn't simply uh, you've you've uh, put into practice uh, what you've learned, and so you couldn't just show up and uh, graduate. Um, in fact, a fair number of people started the class, or um, forgive me, the the sessions with us, and uh, 
and then they didn't show up again and uh, after after a while because they were not truly engaged they weren't participating they were dodging the issue or, or whatever and so only if you had uh, satisfied the uh, conditions of the sessions um, and the and uh, the uh, therapist believed that you were sincere in um, in what you were telling her, uh, would you receive this certificate? And and oh yes, and complete all of the lessons um, and complete the the training. Um did you uh have you undertaken um individual therapy yes um part of the time that i was with sharon it was uh it was individual and uh and i did meet with her individually at times while i was taking the group sessions um even during the group sessions it was um uh, it was mandatory that you uh that you speak with uh her and the others around you every single time and uh and so it was at first i thought it was going to be uh a disadvantage to be in a group session but um i actually found it after having gone through the things that were just personal to me and so forth i found it to be advantageous um i i think it's kind of unique the way that uh she runs the classes um she uh she it uh, people came in from other uh, group sessions and said, "Wow, there's I've I've never seen anything like this." Uh, I was told by the guys and that were there, and I saw it was the case. This was the A group. This was um, she put people in there that she believed only if she believed that they were truly serious about um, rehabilitation, and so she saw that I was and and uh, and I I stayed true to it and uh, and did finish it all. Uh, were all of the people in the groups uh, people who had um, uh, been in uh, professional uh, uh, relationships where they um, abused others in a sexual manner? Not all of them. Uh, some of them were, uh, be, they were other areas where it was uh, some professionals, one other chiropractor, um, and one where it was, or, or somewhere they, the victim was underaged. And so unable to give consent. Uh, approximately how many individual sessions have you had at therapy? I don't want to give you a wrong number. Um, I'm guessing around 20 or 25. And were these all with, uh, you mentioned Sharon, what's the name of your therapist, uh, your past therapist? Uh, Sharon and Sharon. Uh, Sharon Murphy, forgive me, yes, in uh, Vista, California. Have, have you had any other individual therapy with uh, any other therapist? Yes, uh, I had some with Ken Foster in uh, 2015 and uh, and then um, some sessions with um, Victoria Thomas, who the forensic psychologist in uh, Orange County. Uh, and those were all how, private. And approximately how many therapy sessions did you have with uh, Ken Foster? Probably only about five because uh, then I began serving my sentence. And then you mentioned another therapist uh, other than Murphy and Foster. Who was that therapist? Victoria Thomas. And approximately how many individual sessions did you have with Victoria Thomas? My sessions with her were mainly for testing and uh, I believe I saw her uh, three times was all. Uh, have you ever been diagnosed with any type of uh, uh, condition? Uh, or or anything else in relation to your conduct? Yeah. I mean, other than what uh, uh, Dr. Thomas um, uh, diagnosed. And what did Dr. Thomas diagnose? Uh, sexual paraphilia. And what is that? It's uh, a love of um, or uh, 
uh, gravitation toward and love of uh, sexual um, paraphernalia, looking at pornography is the is the main thing I remember from that. And um, I think that you've, uh, for lack of a better word, I suppose, d described the uh, sexual relations you had with your your patients, about a dozen of them, um, as affairs. I I that's the way I originally thought of them, but I know that that's not the case at all. It's. Uh, I guess I wouldn't say the furthest thing from it because there are similarities, but there's, uh, um, but it, they cannot have affairs. Patients cannot have affairs. It was an abuse of a of a fiduciary duty and the doctor patient relationship. They were not affairs. They were definitely not affairs. Um, they were uh, they were sexual battery against uh, patients that uh, people that could not consent even if they wanted to. During uh, the time frame that you had those uh, relations with patients, were you have did you have uh, sexual relations uh, with anyone outside of your marriage other than patients? No, I did not. Um, so all of your uh, sexual misconduct, so to speak, uh, affairs or however you want to reach uh, refer to them uh, at the time or now, were all. Um, with uh, people who are under your chiropractic care? That's correct, yes. And since you've, um, since uh, your license was uh, surrendered, uh, you have not had uh, any professional relationship with anyone else? You've, you've worked and had done work, but you have not found yourself in a, in a, a professional relationship since that time, correct? That's correct, I have not. And, and and why do you think that um, at this juncture um, you won't pose a threat to your patients uh, as you did before? I've uh, I have addressed that is a that is a very good question. I have addressed um, the issues to the best of my knowledge um, and to the best of the knowledge of uh, my therapist uh, that led me to that uh, place the the um the the feelings of insecurity and inadequacy and um really uh i've done i don't i don't really recognize myself much compared to the person that i was before um i don't engage people even in my family uh the same as i used to and uh it's and so I really am, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm a different person. And um, if, but I know you can't depend on, on just that or just my word. And so that's where um, through professional boundaries, because they, they brought that up. You, you know, why would uh, anyone trust you to go back into practice? And that's where, um, so if, if someone isn't honest, they'll sit here and tell you the same things that I am. And so, so why give them their license back? And it's uh, because um, I couldn't be trustworthy because you could put me under intense scrutiny. And so that if, even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be able to, um, to offend or, or harm anyone without your knowledge. And so, um, so the public could be protected that way. Uh, you mean by having a chaperone? Having a chaperone, having a, an open adjusting area to where um, not only the chaperone, but anyone else who's in the office can see everything that's going on. Um, another thing I've learned since um, having the chaperone policy and everything else is it's legal to put video cameras in practice. There are chiropractors who do and who uh, teach how to put that in there in a legal manner in which the patients are fully aware of it, um, where they sign off on it, literally. And so um, so from a, a variety of directions, oh, and, uh, and ask the patients, petition them on a regular basis 
um, how are you being treated uh, in a professional and respectful manner and uh, and have those things available for the board to um, to look at at any time and so that they can uh, you can see is anything going on is uh, is there any any problem here whatsoever and so that that's that's visible and so from uh, that's where uh, professional boundaries they came up with a stratified professional boundary plan so it's multiple levels multiple that's uh, spread out over a great area and so that um, patients are protected from a variety of directions um, and essentially I think what you're saying is the patients are protected because they're not um, in a private environment with you that they're either video or that they undergo their uh, chiropractic treatments um, with other people watching, other patients watching? Um, yes, other patients, but um, but a professional, uh, professionally trained chaperone. And so, um, so the patient would not be alone. It would be not, and I, I wouldn't depend, I wouldn't put an onus on other patients. It would just be, you know, there, there are more eyes um, uh, there to see you. And so, um, to not place any pressure on any patient, um, there are also the the video cameras that would uh, that would be recording everything, and then I would merely never practice in any way, shape, or form anywhere but there under camera, um, under uh, your, I mean, whatever you tell me to do, I would do. But um, that I thought was a um, a very it seemed to me anyway, I'm open to anything else, but um, a very comprehensive list of things to uh, protect patients so that you're not depending on anyone's word. Uh, now, you mentioned professional chaperone or chaperone with professional training. Um, you said that you uh, practiced for uh, several years uh, with a chaperone. Is that right? Yes. Was that a professionally trained chaperone? It was, they were trained by my office. They were, uh, we told them what was going on and so forth. We did not know about professional boundaries incorporated at that point. And so um, I would, uh, I would send the uh, chaperone to, uh, to be trained uh, to receive training by uh, um, PBI professional boundaries incorporated. And, um, and then anything that uh, you wanted us to, uh, to train them with we would be more than open, actually anxious to do anything that uh, you wanted us to do. Well, when when you practiced with the chaperone, um, that was a chaperone that was your employee? Yes. A chaperone that you trained? Yes. Now, uh, I, th I think you, you described um, a few things about yourself that you feel Sort of uh, led you to, or you, you know, were, were were a part of you that 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 led to um, your misconduct. And I think you described it as um, things in your past, like being a doormat, that you would take things, that you were passive, you would let others overstep their boundaries. Is that right? Uh, much of it, uh, not necessarily. Oh, take things. Forgive me. Yes, that was part of what led to it. Yes, y your passivity. You're, you're being a doormat, you're letting other people overstep your boundaries, you feel led to this? Um, actually, uh, it was a contributing factor, yes. Well, what I'm trying to understand is, is you describe the things that, 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 that uh, led you to this behavior as being a doormat or you taking things that you shouldn't being passive and letting others overstep their boundaries but it seems to me that it uh in this conduct that you were treating others as a doormat that that you were being aggressive and others were being passive and that you were the one overstepping boundaries not other people so it seems like your conduct is the opposite of what um you say were your traits or characteristics or personality that, yes. that led to it? Yes. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on that. Can you explain, um, can you explain that to me, um, how you feel you being, I guess, 
victimized to some degree led to your victimizing of others? Very good question. Thank you for thank you for that. So I can clarify um, being a doormat to others and putting up with a whole bunch of things until I felt like I was, uh, you know, I was not taking care of myself and so on. I'm sorry, this might be a long answer. Um, uh, feeling like I or not taking care of myself, not taking any time away from the office, uh, putting all of my uh, identity into into um, just being a work machine and so forth, and um, and taking it like you said, uh, just putting up with everything led me to um, and being passive led to my aggressive behavior, and so um, I was passive aggressive. And I acted out in that way, uh, taking advantage of patients. Um, I felt validated um, by them, and uh, and and I and so I acted out in in that fashion because my passivity led to my feeling of aggressive and acting out aggressively. Does that make sense? Well, it's it's an answer, and thank you thank you for that. Um, and uh, and and well, I, I guess tell me what it is about yourself, um, regardless of um, being monitored. Let's say that you know if you're always under video, if you're always under scrutiny, if it's always um, uh, at the uh, risk of being caught. Um, you, that uh, you feel provides safety uh, for your patients. Um, can you tell me what it is about yourself that absent anyone watching you, what it is about yourself that provides safety for your patients in the future if you are reinstated? Thank you for that. I offer the uh, I offer all of these safeguards merely to um, appear more trustworthy. Um, uh, for this, so that there's verifiability for the board for to protect to, to protect the the public, and so within myself, um, I don't I wouldn't go anywhere near that behavior again. It's destructive. It has it has wiped it wiped out. I don't know how many people around me. I can only know so much of what it did to the to the victims. Uh, it, it, uh, seeing how it hurt them, seeing this much of, of how it hurt them and, um, the, the damage that it did to them, seeing the, fa the damage that it did to my wife, to my children, to my parents, um, to everyone around, it just, it just kept going and going and going and going. It, it was, I mean, that was the thing it, it was. Uh, just that led to seeing that door, so to speak. Um, I'm I'm never going anywhere near that again. I'm uh, it's the the thought of it. Um, the thought of it, for lack of a better term, really would freak me out. And so I am. Um, so there have been those changes in me. I don't think that's a complete summary, but there have been those changes in me. I offer all of these other things just to show um, so that actually I can verify uh, to you, I am completely serious about the changes that have taken place in me. I could go anywhere and uh, and adjust someone without scrutiny and want absolutely nothing to do with anything but a doctor-patient relationship that's completely above board. And so, and, Work on people and and help them and and uh, and affect them in ways that only chiropractors can and uh, and and see all of the good and do all of the good that um, that chiropractors can do. Um, there are all the good things that I would want to do and um, that I, I fell back in love with what I did in those last few years and I would love to see that again, um, but. It's not for me. It would be for the public. Um, the uh, and so 
I believe that I, uh, I would be perfectly safe going into practice um, without scrutiny. Um, however, uh, so that everyone, including the patient, can feel safe, I would, um, I would want safe, those safeguards in place so that they can see them and, uh, and put them at ease. And um, again, the verifiability so that you don't have to just trust someone at their word. Uh, and how long were you uh, practicing as a doctor of chiropractic? Approximately 20 years. And do you have any uh, letters of reference or support from any of your prior patients? Uh, yes, actually. Um, uh, I didn't, I got some immediately after the conviction, actually, and I did not go back to them and ask for this. I, I haven't told. I've told very few people, um, my wife, uh, my children know that I'm here. Um, I did not um, trumpet this, nor did I uh, want to ask them for, for help um, in, in writing any letters. I would be happy to ask people and um, I, I could get a, a stack of letters for you if it would be helpful. My church, uh, there actually, there are some letters of uh, recommendation throughout the um throughout the uh the exhibits through somewhere in here i'm not sure where they are um letters of uh, affirmation from uh, from people at our church a uh, couple from the vfw talking about um my service there uh, but i haven't gone after anything new okay but but nothing from chiropractors practitioners or uh, uh or former patients uh, nothing. Yes, uh, but they're uh, they're several years old. But nothing submitted in support of your petition. No, no, there is not. I I would be happy to provide you those uh, old letters. Uh, if it would, uh, if if you want them, I would be more than uh, happy. I I have them in my records to provide them to you. Or or and and uh, get new ones. And so, because I can, I'm very confident I could provide you many of those. And so, um, so I would be pleased to do so if you request it. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Ms. Kelly, anything on redirect? Sorry, I was muted. No, your honor. All right. Um, so I'll check with the board for any questions. Um, Dr. Paris, any questions? Uh, yes, I do have a, a few questions. Um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Marsh for being here today. And, um. I want to applaud your, uh. You know, all your efforts in rehabilitation and clearly you've thought about this a lot and made a lot of effort to. Um, you know, of, of your own accord um, to to uh, provide some patient safety. Um, I, I have a, I, I do have a couple of questions about something that I don't think was brought up and maybe not considered here yet. Um, and I was wondering when they mentioned the uh, previous patients, um, you, you mentioned a decade ago or so from when you were interviewed by the, I believe it was the police officers or was that a, a board investigator police officers? Um, I was wondering, could, would you at this time or at that time, did you still have the ability to I to self identify those patients? Like, could you think of those situations and who those people were? Yes, I could. And, and to this day. I could at the time, although I couldn't come up with them during the interview with the policeman. Um, I was able to afterwards and, um. I, I don't know that I could find them. I haven't seen any of them for years that, uh, that I would be able to, um, I believe that I could, I can come up with some, I can probably come up with all of them. It's yeah. pretty painful and it's uh, something that I, I didn't want to um, bring to mind a lot. And so I can't, I probably could not enumerate them for you at this moment, but I would enumerate those if you so desire. Sure. 
Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, are you planning to reopen your practice? Are you in the same general area uh, where the violations occurred? Yes, I live in the, the same town, uh, the same valley. Um, I, I did not move. And so I would not open here. I would go, I would uh, commute somewhere else and uh, where, um, where I'm not known and where it would, um, I would, it would be completely new. Um, and so I, are you aware that, that there's, there's no statute of limitations on a, a patient's um, right to file a complaint with the board? Yes, I am. And um, are, are you aware of California code regulation 314 that makes it, it makes it the duty of every licensee to report violations um, of the act or regulations um, to the board or to the executive officer? I am, I am not uh, presently aware of that, no. Uh, ha had you ever considered um, based on, based on that, had you ever considered self-reporting your violations that you admitted to? To the board, I know you admitted them to law enforcement, but had you ever considered bringing that to the board? I don't recall at the moment. If it did, I was probably just too scared to do so. Um, I don't remember uh, whether I considered that or not. I'm sorry, doctor. Um, Okay, I have I have no further questions. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Adams, any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Uh, thank you for your time and being here. Um, I had a question about the uh, kind of the the way the events came down. You. When you were confronted with the complaint um, and law enforcement came, you immediately admitted to your to your uh, your crimes. Um, yes, sir. And, but yet, I noticed that in the paperwork, you submitted not guilty pleas to all the charges initially and went to trial. I'm curious about that. Would you explain why? If you admitted to it, knew you'd done wrong and had had twelve misconducts in in your in your past, why why the not guilty plea? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the for asking that. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to just go straight before a judge and say, Your Honor, I'm guilty. Just let me have it, and uh, and throw myself um, at the, the feet of the court. And so, um, but I went to an attorney because um, I was advised, look, you, you'd better get representation for this. And my attorney would not allow me to. I, I, could, have, uh, I could have done what they said and, uh, or excuse me, gone against what they said and, uh, and said guilty. Um, my attorney at the time said, look, if you do that, the judge is going to um, yell at me and say, what's wrong with your client? You need to take him out. And you know, she said, um, you can't plead guilty. Uh, it will do. And I, I can't remember the, the consequences. However, um, I also was still thinking that I was somehow and I was not guilty of any criminal conduct. I thought it was, um, I said, yes, this is all my responsibility, but, um, and I thought that to a degree, but what I really was thinking was it's my responsibility because I should not have done this. I'm a, a husband and a doctor. And, uh, and so, so it's all my responsibility. I'll take that. But I thought, well, these guys are saying that I pushed myself on them and I thought it was consensual. And so I was under the, I was living under the myth that the misconception that um, I was not guilty of what they were saying. And so uh, that combined with um, 
with what my attorney was telling me of do not go before the judge and do that, or he's just going to chew me out. You have to um, do that. I did not contradict what she said because of what she said and because of that misconception that I had. Um, you admitted to 12 sexual misconduct interactions, two of which um, you were convicted of. The six that you admitted that were old, you, as the, as the attorney general mentioned there, that you mentioned that you considered those affairs. Were those one-time sexual interactions or were those, or, or, were, or did you carry on relationships with, with these six patients? Some of them were one time and uh, some of them were uh, where I carried on relationships. And did you continue working with them as patients? No, I did not. So you, you oh, acknowledge me. that uh, I I did during uh, during what I I thought of as the affairs during the time that I uh, was having relations with them um, I I did see them as a doctor as well which I'm I am I am so sorry and and so ashamed of but um, later I I I did cut it off it it had uh, it had halted if uh, I'm not sure which of those answers your question, but, uh, but I did stop seeing them um, as a chiropractor later on. Um, and when you, when you were having sex relationships with these six individuals, did you continue to charge them for their chiropractic adjustments when you were seeing them as their doctor? Yes, I did. Um, one other question, this may seem an odd question to ask, but, um, do you ever travel alone for vacations? No, I do not. Okay. One other question, it comes from, uh, BCE, uh, page, uh, BCE 000044. Uh, you you state in your in your um, written testimony here that uh, in addition to my own personal insecurities, I was living with the crushing weight of the guilt and shame over the old sexual boundary violations that I had committed ten plus years prior. Counterintuitive as it was, I ended up returning to them in an effort to escape from my troubles. Can you explain what you mean by that escape from your troubles? Um, it gave me a, a literally a release uh, t from uh, from the my uh, my own problems, my own uh, feelings of insecurity and so forth to be validated by uh, by these patients. Um, and so um, it provided a mental escape. And so. Um, Uh, it made me, it made me, you know, gave me a temporary uh, feeling of uh, of happiness. Uh, uh, it it was as as uh, awful as it was, and so forth. And even though I then felt guilty over that, I was I I engaged in it as uh, uh, yeah, just uh, that's the best way that I can think of. And presently, it's the only way I can think of to describe the uh, the feeling that came. Uh, that caused me to want to uh, to escape from all the all the pressure, all the grown up pressure that you uh, that you should just face like an adult, and uh, like I do face like an adult now, rather than running from it. Does, and does my that final, answer your? Yeah, fi yeah. My final question is um, uh, is um, how are you keeping your skills sharp? Well, um, two answers to you. Uh, one is uh, I'm not because I can't adjust anyone. And so, <laughs> so as far as adjusting, um, 
well, let me let me address the, the continuing education. I have um, I've continued reading. Um, I talk with other chiropractors. Uh, I've gone to. Um, there were 124 hours, I believe, that were uh, required of continuing education, and I've I've taken hmm, about 180 hours, I believe, that I that I got credit for. I've actually taken about half again as much, or one and a half times as much as as was required. Um, I figured it was those were more guidelines than uh, than well, it's a rule to get 24 hours per year, um, but there's nothing wrong with doing more than that. So. So I've stayed up on the uh, the mental side of it. Um, it would merely be the uh, the day to day operations of of adjusting patients that uh, that I would really need to uh, hone my skills on. And what I was uh, a plan I had at least in my mind was I would not return into regular practice immediately, but um, but upon uh, receiving my license, if I were to, um, if you were to see fit to do that, I would start by uh, using my family as guinea pigs, uh, just like during chiropractic college, and uh, and start adjusting them, and uh, and then um, down the road when uh, when ready, uh, re go ahead and return to um, seeing the public. Thank you. I have no other questions. Uh, Mr. Sweet, any questions? Yes, Your Honor, just a few questions. Um, good morning. Uh, I did hear some mention of, I, I believe it was your counsel that mentioned uh, boundaries classes. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit on what those consisted of? Yes, they were. Um... They were through the University of uh, UCI, the University in uh, Irvine, and uh, they um, they were they coordinated with that school to to bring seminars in Southern California to go all around the country. Um, it is led by um, they are weekend classes and uh, therapy sessions and uh, classes and therapy sessions um, all weekend long and uh, and followed by. Um, um, accountability seminars that are conducted over the telephone and uh, with a group call, um, weekly group calls. And in the um, in the there is work that is done ahead of the class where you are um, there is material to be read, um, such as at personal risk, which is a, an excellent, excellent educational uh, piece, and. Uh, and some other material, and then go into the uh, seminar, the uh, group class uh, through the weekend, and uh, and then that was uh, that was mainly it through the uh, oh, and there they have um, uh, available online. They have a tremendous amount of um, ongoing educational materials. Uh, it is run by a psychologist. Um, who used to practice in Florida, had a boundary violation himself, and uh, was unable to uh, continue practice. And so he turned out everything that he learned through that experience into um, an opportunity to teach other uh, professionals um, about how to um, recognize boundaries, um, how not to not to approach them, and uh, know where the know, know where the boundaries are. Um, know why they're there, and uh, and then you can uh, then you're armed to uh, uh, not come near them again in the future. And so, um, it was a. I believe it was the most professional seminar that I've ever been to, and uh, and uh, because of the amount of material that. Uh, that I, I learned from this, at, at least in this capacity, I've been to a lot of good seminars. I'm not sure if I, I give it that moniker or not, but, um, but because of the amount of material, the professionalism with which it was presented and, um, and the follow up that's available. Um, it was very comprehensive. And, oh, by the way, I did uh, go to those weekend seminars uh, twice, two different occasions, um, a few years apart. Um, it's very expensive, and so um, 
their and their weekly calls are are quite expensive as well. And so, if uh, if granted, if and when granted my license back, I would resume those no matter what the cost. Uh, the reason that I haven't continued them is I'm not living in that context uh, right now. I you know I'm not seeing patients at all, and so. Um, I, I really didn't have anything, especially after completing the uh, uh, the therapy that I had. I, I didn't have anything new to share with them, and and it was a financial uh, enough of a financial burden that I didn't continue it. I would uh, I would start those again um, in a heartbeat at your uh, at your request. Thank you, and um, I think you also touched on this as well, but I, I want to just allow you to fully explain it, but you mentioned a boundary protection plan. Um, what would that boundary protection plan consist of? It would, um, a, a number of things, um, not changes to an office, uh, there is no office, um, but uh, I would set up an office in such a way that there would be no private rooms. And so um, my last few years of practice, I had private rooms. I just kept the uh, the um, chaperone there. Um, I would have a chaperone again, uh, better trained. Although the ones that we did train with the direction of uh, of a medical doctor friend who um, who had uh, who offered a tremendous amount of help to us, um, that was that was good. It um, they would have that training and more. And uh, so through uh, PBI, um, Professional Boundaries Incorporated. Um, so we would have physical changes to the office where there would not be private areas. Um, the, uh, the, there would be video cameras inside so that uh, with, again, so the, and, and uh, I believe uh, I got that from um, doctors Yamamoto and Meyer at, uh, at some seminars I took of theirs um, where they have the forms for patients to, to um, uh, agree to and sign, um, they've gone through. You've you've already uh, gone through those. Uh, Dr. Yamamoto did appear before you with his plans. I'm I'm pretty sure. Uh, at least he spoke of that in his uh, seminars. Um, there would be so there'd be the video monitoring. There would be um, the patients filling out um, paperwork um, anonymously, uh, telling whether or or not. Um, whichever you would like, um, telling if uh, you whether they've been uh, treated in a professional manner or not. Um, they would, uh, let's see. Um, oh, I, I can be monitored by another doctor of chiropractic and uh, whether uh, whether it's somebody you choose or somebody that I choose, somebody who would be willing to um, meet with me and um, or that's, these are all, you might say, or this is, uh, more of a suggestion because this is kind of new. I, I got it from PBI, but they can provide you with, uh, information or accountability somehow or another and meet with me, see how I'm doing, et cetera. And, uh, and so I would be monitored. Um, I'd be, um, uh, I would be getting the counseling again, uh, uh, more of a maintenance uh, counseling at this point, and uh, and they can report to you as well. And so, I would be uh, scrutinized um, from more than one direction, um, in every direction that I can think of, and I'm open to others as well. Uh, the office would be open, and and it would be there for not the entire world to see, but uh, for your eyes and. Uh, and any patient size that wishes to see the video. And so um, from as many directions as I could, uh, as I could think of and professional boundaries is able to come up with, um, that's where um, I, I was able to put together this boundary protection plan. And so, and if you can think of anything else, I, I would do anything you told me to do. Oh, uh, polygraphs. That's another way that um, I can be monitored and see if I'm being truthful um, when asked any questions that you want asked. 
or uh, someone you appoint to have uh, who can handle uh, these matters uh, professionally. If, if if they were to uh, come up with a list of things, okay, I want them to ask this and this and this. And you go down the list, and um, and I could be uh, I could be asked those things under polygraph examination as well. And so so that was another way that um, that I discovered where. Um, you could see, you could monitor me, the office, make sure that the patients are, are being protected. Those are the main ones that come to mind. There may be more in there, but, um, uh, and you do have that information. Um, I'm happy to go through the, the papers, uh, um, with you. Um, but the. But I, but I would, I'd, I'd be happy to institute any of these things, any and all, and more if, if you, uh, whatever you see fit. Understood. Thank you. Um, last question from me is, um, you mentioned providing free services to, to vets. Were, were you providing adjustments? I'm not, I'm not right now. I would, uh, that's what I would add to what I'm doing. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. No, I am not adjusting vets. I'm not adjusting anyone. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm uh, providing them tacos and uh, frying tortillas over a pan. Um, I'm uh, or in a pan. I'm uh, uh, that's yeah. I'm I'm doing uh, kitchen work presently for the for the veterans. I would um, then take some of those. Uh, I would take those same veterans that are underserved and offer them pro bono care. Offer them free care so that uh, I can serve them in yet another way. While continuing um, what I've been doing uh, for them presently. Thank you. I don't. I don't have any further questions. Ms. Cruz, any questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, understanding the level of discretion you've taken, kind of leading up to you know, this particular hearing. If your license is reinstated. Are you okay being, with being placed on probation where in that probation period you're required to inform patients of the reason you're on probation? Absolutely. Yes. And you had mentioned um, earlier that, you know, kind of leading up to leading up to this hearing, you know, you've uh, kind of kept it. Uh, kept it close. So kind of, I wanted to kind of do a double check on, you know, one, the level of discussion you took leading into this, but knowing that kind of, if you, your license is reinstated and placed on a, in, on probation, that that wouldn't be the case anymore. You would not be able to hold it as close. I, I merely kept this, um, this meeting close. Um, on a personal note, the, the whole thing, It's been, uh, it was, especially at the beginning, humiliating. So, um, um, I didn't want, um, forgive me, I didn't want to um, put myself out there for everyone to see one more time. If If you said no, um, well, whether you said yes or no, I didn't, I, I hated dredging these things up with people unless it was in a, uh, like a, the, those that are over me, uh, the VFW at church, uh, my family and so forth. So I've told, um, close family members and, um, uh, my head deacon and about this meeting, but it's, it's only this meeting, but, but I think that's it. Just because I've, uh, it really has been humiliating. Understood. Thank you. No additional questions. Dr. Daniels, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'll try and keep it uh, brief. Um, Mr. Mars, do you need a minute or are you okay with a few more questions? Good. Okay, go right ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just logistically, um, have you given thought to I, I read your plan um, and I hear what you're testifying today as far as the safeguards. Um, 
have you given a uh, thought to say the chaperone wasn't available or the chaperone was sick or a patient calls you um, and they really need to see you, their back is out and, you know, have you given some consideration as to how are you going to deal with that? Absolutely. There's um, patients would be canceled if I did not have a um, board approved chaperone in place. And so they would, um, it would be hard on the practice, but that it doesn't matter. I would never see a patient again um, without a chaperone. And uh, that is because uh, the the public would be protected, but really it'd protect me too against uh, um, a uh, any allegations uh, that would come or more easily if I were if I were alone. And so, um, but really, it's all about the patients. And so, uh, for their protection, I would not see patients. Um, I would have. Uh, I would have staff call and cancel them and close the office. If a patient really, really absolutely had to see me, well, they can go and see someone else and um, they they can call 911 if it's that bad. There are, um, there are doctors uh, that I know presently, if I didn't work here, I would know other chiropractors uh, in the area where I uh, would have an office and they would uh, they would be referred to them and uh, and I'd let those doctors know ahead of time what was going on and so um so absolutely not a patient's no patient would be seen without a chaperone and so by no patients you mean both male and female patients oh, all yes. patients no. all patients okay uh so kind of leapfrogging off of that question you had mentioned that you would not practice or open a practice if you were given your license back in the area that you live and that you would go someplace else. Why is that? Uh, because I gave my practice to another doctor and, um, and I would not want to uh, diminish that. Um, it is, he's very successful in it. It's going very well. Um, it's, uh, it, I, I still am known in this community. Um, it would be, uh, you know, I mean, word would get around. It's a it's a small town. Uh, well, if I mean compared to a lot of towns, um, and so I would merely uh, go somewhere else so that it would not um, jeopardize that practice. And um, it, it, I would not want anyone to misunderstand uh, my going back as uh, for any reason other than to to um, help patients. Um, if there was a, I don't know, a family member of a victim that was offended by my going back into practice, if there was a victim themselves, which I'm, I'm unaware of any being around here anymore, um, but, if, but if there was, well, I, I wouldn't want them to be, uh, take offense to it. Um, I wouldn't want to appear uh, prideful or any, really anything negative. Uh, and and so I I wouldn't want them to misunderstand why I'm going back. And so, really, okay. that's that's the primary thing. It'd be I also wouldn't want to uh, drag down the pr um, previous practice that that belongs to another doctor. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions. Um, you had mentioned that you have uh, seen um, the harm that has uh, come to the victims. Um, but in another testimony, you said that it was diff difficult for you to remember uh, some of the earlier victims. Um, and so I would like you just to briefly elaborate on what exactly, what have you, how have you witnessed the harm that you caused to the victims? It was imagining it. Um, and when I uh, imagining the harm um, or um, in reading the material that I had and going through the counseling that I had and and um, finding out it affects them in this way that, that they'll be depressed, they'll avoid going to another professional, they'll uh, they'll struggle with uh, feelings of of uh, did I cause this? They'll um, they will lose confidence, they will, uh, they will have troubles in their re personal relationships. 
they will uh, they they will need to go um, and and get therapy. They will need. I mean, it 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 causes significant harm. When I when I say that I don't uh, I don't remember it's it's the names because I try not to think about it to that degree. Um, it's that really was a and it it is a weight. I'm I try to or what I do is set it aside so that whenever it hits me and that tremendous uh, uh, shame uh, hits me like a like a load of bricks, um, I do set it aside and it, uh, just so that I can move forward. And so when I, and, and I don't want to bring to memory their names, I don't want to bring to, you know, um, uh, and so, and if I, you know, and when I do remember, it's uh, it it is with with agony, and so um, so anyhow, um, in I believe it was in a, a book from Professional Boundaries where they talk about uh, the some of the effects that have been cataloged uh, by victims of of similar crimes, uh, where I where it hit me. Um, how deeply it would uh, affect them. So, so it's a combination of, yes, it, it, uh, if I remember the original question, I, I don't want to bring to recollection their names and so forth, uh, but yet I am, uh, I am acutely aware uh, this, this much later of how it uh, uh, impacted them. Um, seeing some of the ways that it impacted me, I, I can project upon them because there are some similarities in some of the areas, and and so um, so it, it it really sounded yeah it, it was it was just awful, and so thank you is um and you had seen I believe three different therapists one was really more for testing but you saw two others for some private sessions, and then you had the group sessions, um was it not addressed as part of um, the rehabilitative process of truly acknowledging those victims within your head and in your heart as far as each individual uh, person so that um, that you can resolve your shame around that. Was that not addressed in the sessions? Good question. That was, uh, that was a, actually a big part of it uh, was restitution of the victims acknowledging and and owning what you had done and it was brought up every single time uh it was uh, not to not to pound you over the head with it not to pound me and uh other patients over the head with but to acknowledge it and um forgive me um you know, to to face up to it and uh, and not not minimize not deny uh, any of the effects that took place. It's uh, it's something that I do without. I try not to. I can I can picture faces, um, but I um, but I try not to bring names to my mem to uh, to the forefront of my mind. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it is uh, another level of painfulness. Um, each individual person, um, it, we, you, we do, we did talk about that and regularly. That's, that's and, sufficient. Uh, Thank you. Therapy. I just have one last question. I'm sure stomachs are uh, rumbling. So just um, you had mentioned, you know, correctly that you're not allowed to adjust. However, that's just a small portion of what a chiropractor does. Um, there's diagnosing, there's evaluation, there's exam, and that requires a level of physicality um, in coordinating our bodies in order to perform that, as well as a level of cognitive processing that happens simultaneously, and that does take a bit of practice. Um, have you not done any, I, I didn't hear that you have uh, kept up on your skills in that level, so not the adjusting skills per se, but the other as far as understanding how to perform a physical exam, what it takes physically to perform that exam, how to position your body, um, especially with a female patient uh, in performing just regular orthopedic tests, not just a an adjustment. Have you uh, given that any consideration? 
Um, yes, and actually that portion of it, I have been able to with continuing education um, and looking at old books and so forth, um, with orthopedic tests and exam stuff and so forth, um, uh, been able to keep up that portion of it. I haven't actually taken any courses in uh, in being uh, in in treating uh, female patients differently uh, uh, with um, if if again if I understand your your question correctly um, not a not a special one for doing all of this with a female patient um, but it in my own mind is forefront in the mind because I don't want any feel female I would never want a female patient to feel compromised in any way shape or form and so I can say that to myself um, how would I do this so that that is accomplished for that patient and so so I haven't gotten training that was specific to it it's specific to it in my mind if if that uh, makes sense yeah uh, thank you so much um, I'm uh, have no more questions thank you Right, I think that's all the board members, but I'll uh, double check to see if any other board members have thought of any subsequent questions. So any further questions by the board? All right, hearing none, Mr. Mars, thank you very much for your testimony. You're excused as a witness. Uh, so Ms. Sure. Kelly, uh, do you have any further evidence? I do not. Okay, do you rest? I do, petitioner right. rest. Uh, Mr. Stone, do you wish to give a closing argument? Uh, yes, uh, very briefly. Thank you. It, it, it goes without saying, but I still must nonetheless say that, um, that serial, serial sexual battery uh, against patients is at the most egregious level of, um, uh, misconduct that a practitioner uh, can commit. Uh, in, in terms of petitioners' um, sexual proclivities or affairs or, or how, however it's phrased, <clears throat> this conduct didn't go towards uh, people generally. Um, all of this conduct was uh, zeroed in on his patients. And um, in effect, it was his licensure that gave him the power to uh, commit these acts uh, repeatedly um, on a number of patients over years uh, to inflict uh, those harmed uh, to 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 those patients, um, and it is uh, up to him to prove uh, that he has been re rehabilitated uh, by clear and convincing evidence. And those are the only thoughts that I would like to uh, convey to the board. Thank you. All right, Ms. Kelly, your closing argument. Yes, thank you. Understanding that. Uh, the violations were serious. I don't disagree with the attorney general and it is the most egregious type of conduct. However, um, one of the reasons that Dr. Mars um, did not run into court and plead guilty immediately is because he was charged with felony conduct in the beginning and it was not felony conduct. His lawyers explained that to him and the, um, the court realized that and recognized that once the evidence was, was um, uh, put forth. And so, um, exercising his right to to go forward was the only way that the the legitimate charges would be would be would be lodged against him. Um, you know, his chaperone policy, and I understand that Dr. Morris testified to this, is is not something that he believes he needs. It's something that will satisfy um, the protection of the public and the minds of the board members, and which is the primary goal, obviously, is protection of the public. He spent a lot of time on the chaperone policy when he was first um, when he was first charged, and it did work well. I want to point out that when the investigators first came to talk to Dr. Mars about one patient, Dr. Mars was the one that told uh, the investigators about everything else. He he was honest and forthright and told them about absolutely everything that had happened. He was happy to be caught. He wanted it to end. And he's taken every single step that you can take as a man, as a person, to try to rehabilitate himself, to try to figure out what had happened, why he had behaved this way. He's a very religious person. His wife uh, stood by him and he, the church has reinstated him. The criminal court has dismissed his case because of his, you know, perfect adherence to the rules. And I don't, 
I disagree with the attorney general. This is not a serial type of situation. It is a man who acted um, and repeated conduct. When you use the word serial, serial, it looks like he can't be rehabilitated. And this man has been rehabilitated. His counseling, his his efforts to be diagnosed, to figure out, you know, the humiliation of trying to figure out what is wrong with you, you know, especially when you you had no insight in the beginning. And over the years, he's developed amazing insight. His therapy, his boundaries work. He's willing to submit to any conditions that the board thinks is appropriate. You know, whether it's five years of probation, any tests, anything that that um, that the board feels is appropriate. He's paid everything he owes. He's um, done what everything that he can, and his plan going forward, you know, to help the veterans and to help el the elderly and to go forward and you know be the man that that he um, has become. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, he went from a, a successful chiropractor to a carpet installer. He has been, you know, um, you know, financially devastated and he has learned and come forward in that in that manner and have become a better man and a better person and would be a better chiropractor. Uh, I know him and you do not, but I have watched him over the years. I, I was the one who um, uh, discussed with him the surrender of his license. I communicated to the attorney general at the time. We discussed all the other patients. We discussed all of that, and through me, he did um, let the the um, the board know uh, through the attorney general's office at the time of the surrender. Um, there was no reason to, you know, file more complaints. He was surrendering his license. So um, I hope that uh, that you will give him another chance. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ms. Kelly. So that concludes the hearing in this matter. Uh, the records close, the matter is submitted, and we are off the record. Um, so, Ms. Kelly, as you uh, may have heard me tell um, the prior council, um, the board will deliberate um, in closed session after hearing um, all the matters today. Uh, so, a, a decision won't be issued today, but will be issued in the future. Um, and then um, my office will provide the court reporter, uh, court reporter form uh, to you, if not today, then um, tomorrow for your records. Thank you. Do you, any, do you have any questions? I do not. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much um, and good luck to you. And Dr. Paris, I'll turn the matter back to you. I'm sorry, did you want to know my page number? Your yes, Honor? I'm sorry. I just realized I didn't ask. If I could get that, please. I have 76 pages. Thank you. And I believe we were going to uh, break for uh, lunch at this time. And so I was uh, going to recommend we come back at uh, 30 minute 110. It'll give us a little more than 30 minutes there. Is that okay, Judge Wong? That is perfect. Whatever the board pleases. Okay, we'll take a break until uh, one ten for lunch. All right. Thank you. Thank you.